Good evening. Call to order the uh, November 7th, 2016 meeting of the Arlington Redevelopment Board. <coughs> Recorded by ACMI. We have a number of things on our agenda tonight, so I'd like to get things moving pretty quickly. Uh, first up this evening is a continuation of the public hearing for EDR Special Permit Docket Number 3511, uh, 11 Water Street, Massachusetts Patient Foundation. This is continued from the prior hearing that we had asked the applicant to bring back. Information, additional information, hopes of our questions were answered from that evening. So, with that, I will reopen that public hearing and ask the applicants to introduce themselves. Thank you, Mr. Brunel. Valerio Romano, uh, attorney with compliance officers for the Massachusetts Patient Foundation. And I also have Daniel Carton, who's the chief operations officer. I interrupt you for this one second. We have a sign in sheet going around. If people could uh, just keep that moving around the room. Please. Sorry. Oh, no. Excuse me. And, and Tony Cassicetti from Hayes Engineering. Uh, Mr. Lakash, uh, who was here last time, expresses uh, his wishes to be here, but he just got married. Uh, so he's, you know, on his honeymoon. Uh, but he'll be following closely. I bet he's watching from wherever they are. So, uh, <coughs> so with that. Uh, be a good satellite. Yeah. <laughs> there, uh, there has been some updates since the last uh, ARB hearing. Uh, one of them, and I think one of the most important important and valuable ones is that the Massachusetts Patient Foundation has in fact received a provisional registration uh, for siting in Arlington from the Department of Public Health. So they are actually now a registered marijuana dispensary uh, in Massachusetts. While they're not open yet, they've paid their annual registration fee, they're firmly in the process. Uh, and so the department, you know, the, all the vetting, background checking, all the, the operations plans, all that has been a thorough review in the department wants them to proceed in the process. So we're, we're firmly at the discretion of the municipality. Um, I know that um, the foundation also submitted a letter from Hayes Engineering clarifying traffic estimates. And if that comes up again tonight, uh, there's a couple different ways we can approach that. And I'd, I'd definitely like to speak to that some. Uh, we also submitted a proposed security uh, plan, uh, policies and procedures, uh, inventory policies and procedures. Um, and a draft of our staffing plan, which I know was a, a question before, and you know further clar clarity on our operating hours, uh, which I know had come up, although I, I did see them um, in the design review uh, package, but I know that came up. So with that, um, I would turn it over uh, to the board if there are further questions. I don't know exactly. I, I watched the previous hearing, although I wasn't here. And I think we went through everything. And I think, at least in writing, we've, we've submitted uh, the additional material that the board asked for. Actually, uh, I didn't have anything on, on uh, the materials presented. So um, I don't know if that's what we can No. I think uh, I have the same opinion. All the materials submitted to each pitch that criteria um, that we are we're supposed to judge is credit. I think we met all that. So I have no questions on that right now. Andy. No further questions. David. Uh, I might have one question, but I, I also have a concern. And uh, while I understand that. Uh, <coughs> We, we certainly can uh, uh, look at this permit uh, purely from a perspective of, uh, of the criteria before us. I remain concerned uh, on the buffer zone issue um, and uh, concerned about uh, procedurally moving forward with this at this time uh, with uncertainty as to whether we're uh, uh, acting in accordance with town meetings, uh, understanding uh, when they approved the, the zoning change last year to, to permit marijuana dispensaries. So I, I just wanted to raise that issue because I continue to be concerned that whatever action the ARB chooses to take tonight may be uh, seen as contrary to uh, the wishes of, of town meeting, or if not the wishes, the belief of town meeting uh, when they undertook the zoning changes last year. Um, I don't know if anyone else wants to speak well, to that. I didn't like you that time. Uh, yeah, sure I, I wasn't was chair, chair, but it's not the board at that time. Uh, uh, yeah, well, I'm sure I was chair, I may have been actually. 
Um, but uh, so agreed. There was, you know, as far as time being was concerned, uh, we talked about the buffer zone as, and the legal opinion at the time was that it would apply if it uh, was not uh, dealt with in the bylaw itself. Um, and we come to find out that, that isn't the case. If it's not in the bylaw, then there is no buffer zone. According to, according to the council. Um, having said that, I mean, my own personal view is, is given the different parameters that were put around um, the RMDs within the bylaw, and the fact that we had already kind of gone through one iteration of the buffer zone, thinking it had applied um, as we started this whole process. I myself actually am comfortable that if the buffer zone did apply, that this would be still a, a fairly strong case for this site. Um, depending upon how you look at, you know, there's obviously the library. And as far as the Montessori School, you know, from my perspective, that's a little bit of a tough one because it happened after the application was uh, provided. So you can't really pull the RMD. And if, if the buffer zone did apply, it wouldn't apply to that. So. Uh, and then, so from my own personal perspective, I appreciate, you know, what town meeting thought we were doing. I actually think this works on both levels. There was also um, the, the conflicting opinions that we've seen uh, from DPH on whether the presence of a pediatrician's office would raise an issue if, in fact, there was a buffer zone. Yeah, and, you know, at some point, I think, because of the conflict, you have to, you know, Take your own opinion of that, and from my perspective, I think congregating is kind of scheduled to congregation or something. But you know, because there's no hard and fast rule here, I think we're all going to have to do a. Actually, there is no buffer zone, so so I think there's that too. Okay, so but in my own kind of thought process, as I think about it, you know, and, and getting comfortable with that town. But once again, there is no uh, I did have one question, um, and uh, I appreciated the, the detail about the, the physical security and, and the uh, security plan for the facility. Uh, I, it did occur to me, as this is going into uh, an existing building, um, and just based on, uh, on things that, unrelated things that I've seen in the news over, over the past several years. Has there been any thought to um, uh, potential security issues with uh, intruders being able to avoid your security features by coming in through walls from adjoining offices or perhaps through the ceiling or, or through the floor um, and, and thereby go around the, the security plan? So I could, I could definitely speak to that. Uh, part of the construct, the internal construction, uh, as far as storage, uh, because what, what we'd be getting at is the idea that an intruder might come in and somehow get access to a product containing marijuana um, and circumvent the possibility of being a patient. And, and so part of the security feature in the Department of Public Health, Health will make us do this. There'll be an internal vault room that will be floor to ceiling to walls that it be in, impermeable so uh, so we're not it won't be just you know a drywall or a, a roof tile that somebody could drop into and and get at the cannabis in that room the, the department of public health simply will not let us construct the vault room in that manner so we can that's the, it, after having done this all over the state now that's that's very clear is that the vault room has to be floor and ceiling and walls impermeable so that that will absolutely be resolved at the construction time and we can certainly if it makes the board feel better make that you know that room and that floor wall ceiling a condition of the special permit and make sure that we you know we do it and, the, and there's some teeth to it uh, so that it, it holds up in the long run bless you well that certainly addresses my concerns so thank you great thank you <clears throat> it will allow for excuse me allow for a brief period of uh, public comment just to nail down some final issues. 
As always, please keep your questions brief. Address them to the board and not to the applicant. And when you stand up, please state your name and address. Yes, Hi, my name is Karen Salier. I'm the mother of two seven-year-old twin boys. They go to the public library regularly. They visit the pediatrician regularly. They love the toy store. They go to the Sunday school at the church. They've been in preschool. All of those things that I just mentioned are things that children visit regularly. Oh, I forgot the bike path where they learn to ride their bikes. All of those are within 500 feet of the proposed location. You mentioned the Montessori school, and you said it didn't exist at the time of the application. Now, those of us who have lived in this town know that there had been a preschool in the Unitarian Church for as long as anyone can remember. There wasn't two years ago because the building was undergoing renovation to be ADA accessible. It was closed for one year for renovation, and everybody who knows that church knew that they intended to have a preschool again as soon as the renovation for ADA accessibility was complete. Now, of the locations that I've, the facilities that I've mentioned within 500 feet of this facility, can you tell me this? Can you think of a worse place in this town to locate such a facility? Because I cannot think of any worse place in this entire town for such a facility. Now, if you answer that, that you still think you're trying to worst case, I would ask you, how can you consider having this location in our town without notification of people in this town? I found out about this by reading the Arlington Advocate a few weeks ago. I had no knowledge that this was happening. I visit public locations in this town frequently. I read the newspapers frequently. There's been no public notification. A few, maybe three, four articles on the Arlington Advocate, nothing in the Boston Globe, nothing in the town census, nothing, no town mailing, nothing telling the town that you are considering an installation that would totally change the nature of this town. People come to this town because it's a family-friendly town. Do you know why the property values are high here? Because people come here to, for the schools. All the houses are filling up with people with children. The schools are overcrowded. People come here for the schools. You think they're going to want to come to this town if there's a pot shop next to the public library? By the way, did you know that it's the oldest children's library in the country that regularly has music concerts outside in the summer that are attended by hundreds of children who love attending them every year? You want your children to attend music concerts while they're smelling pot? So I would ask you why you think this is remotely appropriate for this town. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chris Loretti, 56 Adams Street. I'd like to raise this issue of the buffer zone again and dispute uh, Mr. Kerr's comments that the buffer zone doesn't apply. I heard some allusion to a town council. I think has town council given you a written opinion that it does not apply? Yes. Yes. I, I, su I suggest that he's merely representing the opinion of the selectmen, who frankly have been bought off by the drug money that these applicants Mr. Ray, that, that, keep the, that they keep, are willing keep to your share comments, with the town. Special okay. let's, 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 let's get that out on the stuff. table. It was out on the table at the first hearing that you wanted a share of the drug money for the town. Okay. So let's get beyond that. Now, I suggest to you that the buffer zone is a matter for the courts. At the time the applicants made the application, the buffer zone existed indisputably. The Board of Health regulations Board of Health guidance, state, I'm sorry, the State Department of Public Health guidance explicitly said it applied unless the town um, had established their own buffer zone, which I to have not. That they arbitrarily and capriciously flip flop a month or two ago is no reason to suggest that it no longer applies. It's only something that a court can decide, and it may well be decided if you grant this permit and it's appealed, it actually would have to be. I would like to read some of the uh, guidance description of what a facility is where children commonly congregate. Facility in which children commonly congregate, well, the department interprets a facility in which children commonly congregate to include facilities in which children are gathered for a particular purpose in a structured and scheduled manner, but which are dedicated to the use of children, such as playgrounds, youth services programs, daycare centers, youth sports facilities, dance schools, and gymnastics schools. To suggest that a children's library does not fit that definition is outrageous. And frankly, the, the Board of Selectmen ought to be ashamed of themselves for, for indicating otherwise. So I, I, I will leave it at that. The previous speaker mentioned the other schools in the area. 
the day school that has been there for some time. I suggest that they have submitted their building permit application to do the renovations before these applicants submitted their application to your permit, uh, you know, despite the fact that they were uh, perhaps out of that building for a year. And the other thing I think that needs to be mentioned is, as we all know, there's a vote tomorrow, and that vote, there's an election tomorrow, one of the votes that people in Massachusetts will be voting on is to sell this recreational marijuana. Uh, I suggest that you ought to be postponing any action by your board until you know what the results of that vote are, in particular because medical marijuana facilities receive preference for becoming recreational marijuana uh, distribution centers. And I was glad to hear that the, the applicant mentioned that they have the uh, preliminary approval from the State Department of Public Health, because that now means that they can go be before the Arlington Board of Health for their approval. And if you read the zoning bylaw, which the Arlington Town Meeting passed, it says you're not supposed to be acting except on applications as approved by the Board of Health. The Board of Health has given absolutely no approval to this applicant. They haven't even seen the application yet, as far as I know. And um, now that they have, the applicant has that, you know, they approve, they can apply to the Board of Health. The Board of Health has expressed their opinion to your board um, in the context of the, the proposed zoning change about what they expected um, the, <coughs> the requirements would be. And, and indeed, they expected that the state buffer zone would apply as well. So I suggest this is an opportune time not to take any action at all and await the Board of Health action before you do anything else. And I would ask you again, Mr. Chairman, <coughs> to ask the applicant. I won't ask that question. What are the parties they have that question is out of scope, Mr. Murray. It's, it's, it's entirely appropriate. I'm really disappointed that you will not ask it. It's out of scope. Thank you. Other questions, comments? Mm -hmm. Back to the board for any follow-up questions or comments. I have one. Yeah. Is, is, is there a linkage between preference for recreational? I, mean, I don't even know if it's possible to speculate that. Even if it were, that yeah. Yeah. I guess the, I think, uh, I, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know if we really know the answer to that question. That is in town council prior memo. Yeah. 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 He said as far as the children calling. Yeah. 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 to potentially be the ones that participate in that first because they have experience producing cannabis in, in a regulated fashion and providing it to the Commonwealth. Uh, there is no linkage in the sense that Massachusetts Patient Foundation is a nonprofit. So they would, there would have to be another company. Massachusetts Patient Foundation could never sell recreational marijuana. They have to operate for their nonprofit purpose, which is to provide medicine and educational materials to the patients of the Commonwealth. So that's first. Second of, second of all, this special permit will be for a registered marijuana medical dispensary at that location. There's no way that Massachusetts Patient Foundation is going to be doing non-medical at that location. This special permit and the special permit holder, the nonprofit, are the ones that are going to operate there for the criteria under the special permit. So it just can't happen. Uh, the, the, uh, the ballot initiative certainly contemplates the possibility that experienced marijuana operators in the Commonwealth in the event that it passes, in the event that they have a location to do it, will be the ones that are doing it. But it's not, it's a red herring in what we're talking about now. We're talking about medical under a special permit at a specific location. It's just throwing sort of, you know, mud into the water just to make it kind of, to, to muddy, to confuse the issue of what's before the board. Uh, 
I guess, I guess the last thing I would say on, on the topic is, is that folks have to remember this was passed by almost 70 percent of the town during during the time in which it was put on the map. Near, I think it was 68 percent. So personally, I'm not here to litigate whether it's a good good idea or a bad idea. I don't know. I, my own view is that I'm trying to do what the folks in town voted for, what town meeting voted for, and to try to keep that. So that's, I, I think we lose sight of that fact sometimes. So we did not vote for this. We never put it to a vote. Most of the people in this town are not aware that please. this is happening. There, you haven't there have been told several, anybody. He, he wrote, please. There I'm there have been not several going to be silenced. He's advertised. been deceiving you the whole time, and you're gutless. He wrote a, a bill for the town meeting that made it seem like you were going to outlaw medical marijuana facilities in the zoned area. When it, the intent of the bill was the opposite. If you talk to any parents in the neighborhood, they have no idea You're what right, what's please, going please, on. Your Honor, please, please, ma'am, ask to stop. There have been several public meetings that have been noticed. They haven't been announced. Blah, blah, blah. Nobody knew they were happening. That is not true. There have that been is true. Public As that people in true. this town, nobody knows what's going on. There have been several public meetings that have been properly advertised in the appropriate channels under the proper statutes. Everything has been advertised. We had a public hearing in August. We had a subsequent public hearing in October. The Board of Selectmen have had. This has gone from a ballot initiative several years ago to a town meeting. We are now at this point. It was a ballot initiative. Of notice. The ballot initiative was not for this location. Okay. You ask Thank anybody you. to vote for this Thank location, for nobody would vote Thank for you it. For your comments. I appreciate it. Sorry, Sorry, one final comment. Please. Yeah, could I um, just address this issue of converting to recreational sales? Please be um, keep it brief. I would ask, you know, to take the applicant at their word, they really have no intention of uh, converting to recreational sales. That you may, you know, and it appears to me you're going to write this stamp this, that as a condition of the permit, you prohibit any recreational sales, and moreover, you prohibit any transfer of the permit to another applicant. As you know, Special permits typically transfer with the property, not with the applicant. So while they may have no intention of uh, going into recreational sales, once they get the permit, they have a very valuable um, you know, possession that they can sell to someone else who may have entirely different intentions. Um, so I would request that the board explicitly state that if they do get the permit, that it's not um, allowed for any recreational sales. It, be non transferable. And, and just to one final point is that when town meeting passed this, they did so with the, with, with the instructions and the information, I believe it was Mr. himself, that there would be these strict buffer zones. So now you're saying we're just going to go to buffer zones. So I think the previous speaker has an excellent time. circumstances have changed from what town meeting believe. Now that may not in the end change the result of this permit process because even if there is a, a buffer zone, uh, uh, it may not it, it, it may not impact whether or not uh, this facility would be able to, to be permitted. But I think uh, you know taking an action now based on legal opinion that is contrary to town meetings uh, uh, belief and intention uh, when, it, uh, when it created the new zoning for, for R&Ds, uh, I think puts us uh, and the town in, in a difficult position. And you know, I, I don't want to unnecessarily delay this, but I also uh, want uh, want to give effect to the intention uh, and belief of, of town meeting because, you know, after all, we are operating under uh, the decision that, that was taken at, by town meeting last year. I think I'd have to 
to discuss that maybe with planning and also with town council. We can do that. Here's a question, Doug. This was reviewed by the police department, for instance. Yes. Um, and one of the discussions early on was in creating a location was the police wanted this to be kind of like they want to be in the open. In they the open. It's, <coughs> it's something that's easily accessible. There, by we, have, we have drugstores. We have um, other other places like that. And they didn't want it to be buffered away so that it's way out in some extremity that they didn't have to patrol. Right. This is a medical marijuana dispensary. This is a medical facility. What these guys have gone through is pretty overwhelmingly convincing that this is a medical facility where precautions are taken. I do think it's muddy in the waters to say, oh, well, it's going to be a pothouse, whatever you say. That's, that's exactly the opposite of what this is. This is supposed to help people. That's why 64% of whatever it was that voted for it said, hey, this is, this is going to be part of our society. This is coming back as a very important drug that's going to be used for medical purposes. So I think the police and others are taking that into account and saying, hey, yeah, this is exactly where we do want it. It's, there's a drugstore near the high school, within 500 feet of the high school, uh, that sells prescription drugs. This is going to sell prescription drugs. So I think it, there's a, a strong argument that may come out that, again that this is exactly where you do want this. There are always going to be children's activities nearby a central part of the town. So I don't think that that's necessarily even the right argument to make about this kind of facility, not a pot. May I respond to that argument? No, no. CVS caters to the entire population. Public we don't have people closed. driving from miles around to visit CVS. This will be the only medical marijuana facility within a three or four mile radius. Will people drive What's important to know. Around? What's important to know. It's thank you. Thank you for your, we're out of scope here. But thank you for your point. This is a medical facility that is proposed here. It's also important to know that in our prior hearing, proponents, the applicants were very clear to know that there's no on-premise usage. And I'm asking you to speak to that a little bit. First. Absolutely no on-site consumption. It's completely. It's not allowed under the regulations. It's it's just not allowed. People will come and get their prescriptions, certifications, recommendation, and leave. Absolutely no on-site consumption. Period. It's not it's not a pot shop. It's it's a medical facility. You know. It, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, I don't think so. I mean, I'm, I'm just, I, town meeting uh, authorized uh, uh, the uh, commercial districts uh, for uh, potential R&D siting with the understanding uh, that uh, that a, a buffer zone analysis would be conducted for any proposed location. And now we're at a point where uh, uh, there is no buffer zone. And I, I'm not really comfortable uh, uh, that the process has changed, even if the result in the end would, would be the same. If, if, it might, if it would turn out that if there was a buffer zone and we analyzed all of the all of the uh, uh, applicable uh, activities within within the buffer zone area, and, and concluded that uh, uh, that there was nothing to prevent us from, from moving forward with the permit. Um, we're not engaging in that process now, uh, and uh, town meeting is going to wonder why. Well, it was. The proposed buffer zone was brought from the town meeting in October. There was some discussion about that. It was presented, well, it was presented here. It wasn't presented to town meeting. It was presented to us. Yeah. That discussion has been has taken place at the previous meetings. 
well, right, but town meeting, when we, uh, when we passed the zoning change, believed that the default <coughs> state buffer zone was in place, whether or not we took any action. But I think where we are now is that that information, while it was true at the time, appears to be a case. It may be worth, I hate to kick the can down the road for a and wait and delay now any applicant for any purpose. It may be worth a discussion with the planning council, but I'll leave that to the rest of the board. So, from my perspective, I think this board has been put in a very difficult place because essentially what we're talking about is the zoning bylaw not let's just presume it has no buffer zone okay yeah. and let's forget about time so then the question is is in my mind we're now dealing with the public health question and not necessarily a zoning question okay as far as what that buffer zone should be because because the whole notion of the buffer zone in my opinion was a public health issue. I mean, it came out of the EPA, it came out of everything else. Our public health people will have that bite of the app. So we might be kicking it, even if approved, we are kicking the can down the road a little bit. Because in my opinion, I've got comfortable, as I've talked about, that I'm, o I'm okay even under the spirit of mortality in the past. The zones that we've got this, that we possibly don't, are very small. Um, and so my own opinion on it is, is that now that it's a little bit of the wild west as far as the buffer zone is concerned, I think where that belongs squarely is in the public health department and not in this board. I, I think you may be right because, uh, you know, we, uh, as, as far as we're concerned, um, the, the proposed location is within the zone where it is permitted. Um, as far as uh, we have, uh, as far as the, the understanding that we currently have as to the legal status of a buffer zone, there is no buffer zone. So I think uh, our, from that perspective, our hands are, are tied as far as is this uh, an allowable location for uh, for such a facility, and and that it really comes down to all we can look at right now is the criteria for a special permit. Um, so I I think uh, reluctantly uh, I, I I agree with you um, that that our hands are, are somewhat tied as to the scope of what we can consider. What we consider, what we're being asked to consider, is simply what's in the special permit. I think we're at a point where I'd be comfortable making a decision with the other. But we've got to Sales. 
or any purpose, non medical purpose. Also, I just would reference that in my report, yeah. there's suggested general conditions okay. and special conditions that you may just want to capture. Yep, capture. no, I mean, actually, in the, the way I would capture them is by <laughs>
Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. My name is Mary with Stanley O'Connor, and I represent the Housing Corporation of Arlington. With me is Pamela Hallett, the Executive Director, who I believe you all know, of the Housing Corporation, as well as tonight, Cliff Bulmer and Paul Workington from Davis Square Architects, who will speak as to this uh, special permit application at Park Avenue as well. Um, we have the materials, and I'll give a brief uh, overview. Uh, the, this project uh, will, is one of the first projects that will come under the new bylaw, which is mixed use of uh, residential and retail. What the Housing Corporation of Arlington is proposing at this site, and for those of you who lived in town for a long time, this is the old Dairy Queen site, uh, now the Arlington Food Pantry, uh, is 14 residential units with retail on the first floor. Uh, it will be, uh, it's in a, a four zone district, and as the board knows, the bylaw specifically says when you have a B4 district and you can take it out of automotive use and make it another use, should um, uh, consider that type of change. Uh, also, 11.08 of the zoning bylaw talks about the need for affordable housing. Now, this project will involve two one-bedroom units, ten two-bedroom units, and two three-bedroom units. All of the units would only be made available to people earning 60% or less than what would be getting. Now, to give you an idea as to uh, what the need is in this town, there are over a thousand people, um, households. households, excuse me, a thousand households on the waiting list for affordable housing. A little over 300 households are Arlington households. And Arlington households, veterans and homeless people are given priority on the waiting list. Now, uh, here we have, uh, you can see from the plans and the architects will describe to you the fourth floor is stepped back as provided in the bylaw. Now, uh, we've also provided, uh, you have the report from the, uh, from the director uh, of planning with respect to the conditions. We provided an impact statement as well that was utilized in the preparation of this uh, project for this evening. Now, uh, we've also provided a traffic uh, management report. I, I think there's a notation in the planning director's uh, memorandum to you that one wasn't provided, but we provided the same report for Park Avenue as well as Broadway. And uh, what the Housing Corporation of Arlington is proposing is to charge for parking so that there is a, a disincentive uh, for park people having automobiles to provide bike uh, parking as well as storage, and also to provide one space at each location for a zip car type setup so that there'll be rental vehicles. Um, I would suggest to you that um, this board, as outlined in the planning director's report, has the ability to reduce the parking and um, can consider the suggestions um, for traffic management. Now, um, Ms. Hallett will speak to, uh, if you'd like to speak to uh, any other issues with respect to this project, we want to look the architects. I think I'll let the architects go ahead and describe the project to you. Yeah, gentlemen. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'm Cliff Bomer, an architect at Davis Square for Architects. Uh, we're a firm in Davis Square, specializing in, in multi-family housing and primarily in affordable multi-family housing. I'm going to speak briefly about the, the site and sort of the inspiration for the building. Paul Warpington is here with me, an associate at Davis Square Architects who uh, knows the details uh, inside and out better than I do. Uh, but I, starting with where the site is, I think you probably all know it. It's on this little corner here next to a very large open school lot. Currently, the site does have the old uh, Dairy Queen that now does house a, a food pantry. The site is virtually 100% paved. And uh, what we're proposing to do is to do a four-story building. I think people of you can see that, but where you're sitting, we'll stack these boards up. But the idea is to use the, what, we, what we've done to help establish the scale of the building. It is a broad street at that point. Is look a lot at the buildings in the neighborhood, including the homes across the street that are generally gable-ended homes. And that height, the typical sort of height along the street, we picked up with a strong horizontal line where we did the setback, which was in the 
zoning, but I think that was well written. It, it made a lot of sense to us to have a setback at that level. Uh, we're, even though it is affordable housing, I think it's really important to know that it's not, it's not affordable to build particularly. The, the standards that we're held to really dictate very long-lasting permanent materials, and that's what we're looking at in the building. Uh, we're proposing to have a, a brick circular element at the corner, really hold down the corner at that area, and the rest of the building would be uh, clad in a combination of uh, different types of panels. We're looking at some metal panel types, also some uh, cementitious panels, uh, creating a kind of rain screen effect. Uh, so what I think what we're really trying to do is activate the street through the commercial use on the first floor. Right now we don't have that designated. We don't know the tenants fully at this point, so we don't really know exactly how many spaces it is. So uh, there's some flexibility that we'd be looking for as far as how many entries we would need at, along the first floor level. The residential entry is over on the side street. Uh, which gives us the maximum flexibility and best use of that corner for the uh, commercial use. Uh, overall, I think that's about what I had to say. We think it's a wonderful site for family housing. It's right on a huge schoolyard. There are lots of very walkable amenities. Uh, it's a very short walk, in fact, right over to Mass Ave, and uh, not to mention the other sites along Broadway. So in a nutshell, that's what we're proposing. It's 14 apartments. Paul will give you some more details. So as we move to a little closer up on the site, so as Cliff said, here we have Broadway, Everett Street. We move in pretty closely to that edge there. We do have some space that we were able to bring that up back very slightly back in the property line. As you know, the, the zoning allows us to go straight onto the parking lot. We're actually looking to be a little bit further back from that. Uh, access to the site would be uh, from a drive along Everett Street, thereby also minimizing the amount of uh, entrances and exits along a he more heavily trafficked corridor. Um, uh, we have 17 parking spaces in the rear. We'd also have some bike parking at a, uh, at a rear location here. Uh, entrance to the Apartments would be through an exclusive entrance off of Everett Street. The commercial entrances to the commercial spaces would be at the corner here and off of Broadway. Uh, moving on to that first floor plan, you can see we've got some of that covered bicycle space back here, the parking spaces, the entrance off of, the, uh, off of Everett Street, and then commercial spaces along at this location. And working our way up the building, we, we pack it pretty closely. We're not wasting much space for circulation and such on the inside, <coughs> maintaining as much exposure for, uh, for residential units along the perimeter of the building as we can, allowing plenty of light and, uh, and air into that. And you know, I'm, I'm not going to go through all of, the, all of the floors because they stack fairly straightforwardly. As far as, you know, as Cliff said, on the materials of the exterior, we're looking to use brick, a very nice human scale for that, for the facade areas that are closest to the sidewalks, and then going to something that gets a little bit broader, smoother surfaces at the, at the upper levels of the building. And again, stepping this back at the top. And, uh, yeah, oh yeah, no, that's a good way of put this one. So the view from a little bit further back along Broadway, you can see that, that top floor steps back, so we're not viewing it as much. And then as we pull back further along Broadway, you know, the height of the building is, is sort of minimized in relation to the other uh, elements on the, on the street. We're trying to keep the similar scale to some of the other nearby buildings, can such I, as these camera settings. Thank you. Yes. Can I ask a question on that? Um, the Woy building there. I think that's the one that we just approved as the. No, no that's no. 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 that's no. another building down. Uh, okay. okay. Can you 
we ended here. up trying yeah. to purchase that building and we Got it. Somebody else purchased Okay. Thank you. But the reason, and you probably assume that so this elevation is blown <coughs> for a large part of the physical setback from the property. We really can't put windows there because our neighbor has the same rights that we have for development on this side. Is, is that on the property line there? Yes, it is. Yeah, the next building will be a party wall building. Yes. In all, well, we don't know, but in all, like, well, we're, we're, yeah. we're, we're just back from it. If you would, yeah, very slightly. That's good. And our goal is really to get the parking off of the main street, the limiting one, and curb cut. I mean, currently there's curb cuts. There's a very broad curb cut across the whole back of the site there. But yeah, the site you're talking about here, you can see all the cars which recently got to, um, they're all right around here, just the next building down past the Duncan Downs there. We didn't have a full-on elevation of it, but we did include that as sort of like more or less how tall that would be. Uh, we're looking at something that is more detailed than what you've reviewed so far, but we are looking at a very highly energy efficient building. This one is in fact paired with another building for the purposes of funding. So we're held to, you know, uh, even beyond the, uh, the code, which is going to be the, the stretch code, and probably a new stretch code by the time this would get permitted. So we're looking at very high efficiency structure, very thick walls, uh, rain screen, we think, uh, solar ready roof. Uh, we've got great solar exposure. So I guess I would go back to, do we want to talk about timeline a little bit? Uh, I, can, I can talk a little bit. Um, okay. Before you did, did you go around the whole building? Did you, did you get to the back? <coughs> oh, we did the rear of the Oh, yeah. Um, I could get through this maze. Yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. We're 17 spaces, and we were able to find buildings with the hangs and the so this is the uh, this is the Broadway elevation here. With our curve going around here, the brick parts of it we're showing below here. The step back up here at the top. Coming around, this would be the Everett Street elevation, where we've got our our uh, entrance into the. Uh, into the uh, units, and then as we go around back, this is the uh, this is the rear elevation facing that's facing the, side. That's that's the side elevation. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Facing. Uh, oh yeah. I'm sorry. That's right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. This is the yeah. This is the side facing our, our new neighbors. This is the rear elevation <coughs> facing the uh, facing the fields. The cars are partially. Parked yeah. under the building, and yeah. space these cars are parked in, and the trash is on the inside. Inside, the trash is inside. inside. Yeah, trash is stored inside. Oh, from our, for both, for both, yes. Mechanicals all over, all over our town. Either uh, in the basement or on the floor. Yeah, room. we're anticipating having some basic space or on the roof. Yeah. We would screen those. Yeah, rooftop. But we do have some basement space. So the screening's not shown. Correct. Mm -hmm. Screen is not shown. Is that is there a parapet? Is there a parapet, a, a bit parapet. You're kind of seeing the backside of that. Well, this is like the nominal roof line here, this 44. So we've got a, a bit of room here for the parapet on this side. We sort of raise the parapet on the front corner. And just to emphasize that, we can round this up at that front. I guess the only other thing I was like, that I was going to ask was about a lighting plan. I mean, there's no, but what's, what's the expected lighting? And I guess is there, in looking at it, it didn't look like there was any residential at all contiguous or next to it, right? There's no, right. you just had the playground behind no, you. Know, right. we have the playground on one side, we're going to have, uh, we have, you know, this 
yet to be developed site right next to yeah. us, so we don't know exactly what that'll be. We've got the we've got the playground behind us. One side of Everett, we've got a gas station, then the other one side is residential on the other side of Broadway. Do you have a site plan? Yeah. Show the parking. So we've got our parking spaces across the back here. Yes, uh, those trees, that on your property or that on school property? Or the, those are on school. Property. Yeah. They're so so is, there a, is there any buffer from the cars shining the lights onto the field? We haven't quite come up with a buffer. We've, we've, is there any land? We, well, there. Or it could be a solid fence. Because I'm more concerned about cars parking there, pulling in. With the lights. And shining right into the baseball diamond there. Mm -hmm. And a kid to play there, I'm not going to be able to play there. Well, we could certainly think about yeah. putting in a solid fence. Yeah. And that's something we haven't quite got to yet. And then I also noticed that the parking is right against the sidewalk uh, along, um, what's the back what? Everett. 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 It's Everett. It's Everett. Everett. And you have some spots, a little more space on in the inside corner of your lot, can that be slid over so there's at least some buffer zone so when you're walking down the street, you're not, quite close you're not to sitting to a car. I just, I just want to be more sensitive to the neighbors there that you have some landscaping opportunities. I know in the past that was a parking a garage and repair shop, there was no grass anywhere, there was cars everywhere. But I think what you're doing is a good thing. I just want a bit more, a bit more bushes and shrubs and stuff to help us. I I'm concerned about what's considered retail parking and what's concerned what is residential parking. You don't well, distinguish one from the actually, other. Actually, to talk about the retail space, most retail space, we believe, would be taken up by the building uh, and the food pantry. They utilize the current building. Food Link uses it every single day, seven days a week. Uh, the food pantry operates out of there right now, only two days a week, a month. And now they're going to be opening one day of every week. So the majority of that commercial space will be taken up by Food Link and Food Pantry, is what we believe right now. They haven't signed agreements and they haven't signed commitments. But well, you're on that subject, and not just from. Do you have a marketing plan for whatever space is left over? We've already been approached by about four different types of businesses. Uh, some of them, multiple inquiries. And to just back that, back, back up to our kids, um, I don't see a landscaping plan in here. Is that something that we could get? Yes, we look at. plan to provide that to you. Um, it would certainly be focus primarily along the commercial strip on and on Everett, um, and then along the back by the parking. Uh, I know you I noticed that you're deleting the curb cut along Broadway. Yes. I applaud that and uh, but I'm a little concerned about how wide you got um, the curb cut on uh, Everett Street. I mean is that the width of the driveway or is I mean, it just seems really... Yeah, I mean, we're currently showing that as 24 feet wide. Which is what's allowed by town. I believe that's what's allowed by the town. Yeah, technically. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just, yeah. I would encourage you guys to maybe uh, narrow that down a little bit, especially yeah. near the building. Just, it seems where we are right there right now. Just for people walking on the corner, cars there. Just you just want to give a little more landing area. Even though you widen out after you get around it because you have a twenty four. That's right. Yeah. And also <coughs> right. you'd still it's expect it's either going to crash, crash into the corner or get hit by them. You know, or like taking the right hand turn. Narrowing down the, the throat of that also yeah. slows the traffic down so no one's really like 
getting out of there. Mm -hmm. it's just, just get some kind of clearance, you know, like this. Yeah. So when you take the turn, you're not going right into the building or into the walk. And then you then you can go back out. Right. Yeah. Um, a couple more questions? Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm this right here. Where's your transformer? Is one required? Yeah. We don't know yet. We we haven't engineered the building yet, so we haven't contacted the utilities. You know, we, as you know, the the transformer location is kind of a negotiation with the utilities. So we don't know that yet. Okay, but if so you, good but question. If you were to build a building that size, okay, from your past experience. So we say you're going to need a transformer. Right. I know where I live. Is it going to go on? Is it going to go on the site, or is it going to be up on a pole somewhere, or what? And yeah, we don't know that. Yeah, but yeah, but what if it's on the site? I mean, if we're going to prove it, we got to. You have to show us where you're going to put it. Why not you show it? where you would like to put it? Well, I guess I would have to say it would be highly conditional because it's the power company that tells us where the transformer is going. I know where I would put it. And you just kind of negotiate away a little bit of space, but I don't think all the way back there. The power company doesn't want to do that because they have to run their primaries further back. But that's where I would like to put it. If I could. We're, you know, we're short on open space on this well, side. Well, what I'm trying to bring up here, most likely where the power company should put it is the opposite corner. You mean like there? Yes. And unless you have any ability to screen that thing there, now it's going to be a, a big box for graffiti. I'm sorry, but maybe not. I don't know. This is a nice neighborhood. <laughs> yes, I'm going to apologize for that part. <laughs> but it's going to be there, and there's going to be no screening. Or are we going to lose parking space? That's what I'm trying to say. Well, we need to lose parking space. We, I, I would have concurred with yes. Yeah, yeah, I but, these are all sized as full size spaces at this point. I, think. I don't think we have any contact spaces. So we could pick up the number of feet that way, potentially. Yeah. Well, these are good questions. And then the last one I have right here is you mentioned uh, you're planning to use a zip car to offset some of the park concerns. Have you guys contacted the car at all? Uh, we did for Capitol Square and then never actually went forward with it. Um, we have not yet for this one. Because um, Zipcar now are saying that unless it's in a very public space like a shopping center or, or something like that, where there's a lot of foot traffic, they're not going to put a car there just because you guys want one. There are a number in Arlington, you know, right off of Mass Ave on private property. Uh, there's one right next to one of our buildings at 1016. Right. 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 right off of Mass Ave. Yes. Well, I'm just asking if, if they say okay, I'm okay. Yeah. I'm just saying, I'm not saying it's necessarily a guarantee that you wish to have a zip car there. It's going to happen. And if that's a required part of your TDM plan and it doesn't happen, then you may have to rethink uh, the TDM options. Right. Yeah, I have one other thing, or a couple other things on the TDM as well. Uh, um, so, uh, I guess from my perspective, you know, I think charging for parking spots may have the wrong uh, consequence or the end result in the end. Because, you know, I, I'm a little bit concerned that everything ends up on the, on the street. And then you don't really have anything reserved for uh, necessarily for retail in the back there. And you have no space out front because of you know folks you just try to charge them for the spots that they're just parking on the street. So I, I I just feel like the TCM is quite late, and that it needs to get thought out a little bit more. Um, you know, it's not my expectation for uh, the transportation demand management plan to look at three bullet points and have it done. <coughs> The other thing is, is I see the bike parking in there. Uh, I don't know how many bikes that is, or you know, what you think your encouragement of bike will do to the need for parking and that type of thing. 
what I'm saying is I'm not asking the architects, I'm not asking from my perspective, if this is lacking on the transportation demand management. Um, I think that on this particular project, I'm less concerned about parking. Um, maybe on another project, but, um, but I think even on this one, uh, I'm not sure it's been completely uh, fleshed out. <laughs> On our uh, West, County Westminster, we agreed that we would write into the lease the fact that people were not allowed to have cars on site, so we could certainly. Uh, yeah, but then they go up to the street if you're no, not. No, no, they won't be able to. They won't. According to the lease, they cannot have a car. Period. Okay. All right. Then be a basis for determining that. Yep. Got it. Okay. Yeah, I'd like to see that. I'd like to see a little bit more. Uh, plans on the TDM, but also as far as any commercial use in there, whether that would be a little bit more <coughs> or less strict, depending on how that would work out. Okay. Yeah, a couple of things on the, on the drawings first, on the elevations. On the, uh, on the Broadway elevation,
but that's another level of requirement on a special permit that we really need to see it. So if it comes to making a stipulation about uh, samples, it's really important for us to see the actual samples that's required by the special permit submittal. Screening of the mechanical was brought up. That's really important just to show that. Um, the neighborhood wants to know exactly what they really get to see, not, not just a few little low bumps that actually come. I don't think it's an issue. I think it's okay, but you got to show it. Um, sidewalk improvement is probably something that ought to be somehow addressed. Because it's, I hear it's pretty rough for the sidewalk. We're, we're planning to improve the sidewalk on both sides. Broadway and Everett. It'll be wide enough to allow uh, people to have tables or chairs in front of the uh, commercial space if appropriate for the tenant. Um, so those are those are quite a few pieces of important pieces of the special permit that should be filled in. That's all I have. David. Well, I'll, I'll first echo the comment that the, the ground floor uh, facade uh, is not uh, very inviting from a retail uh, perspective. It doesn't look like those of that retail space, and I think the businesses would, would uh, be well served uh, to, uh, to have a more open and welcoming uh, uh, front door uh, <coughs> and, and facade. Um, I mostly want to talk a little bit about uh, biking and walking. And uh, again, I'm glad to hear um, that you're planning to improve the sidewalks. I think that's incredibly important. But um, has there been any, any more thinking about the location and type of bike parking? Uh, or have we just gotten to the point of saying there will be bike parking? We've located a space on the ground floor covered by a parking lot the rear. And I think we've got space for you know four full size bikes kind of parking in on the back there. Is is that it? outside? Or That's outside that? the building, but it's covered. Oh. Yes. We also talked about putting more bike parking over unfortunately where the parking lot is on the other side, uh, next to where the old bike building is now. Uh, so I the trade off. I suggest a couple of things, and um, part of this has to do with the fact that this is this is a mixed use development, uh, and so you have to be thinking about uh, bike parking uh, both for uh, uh, well for three groups: customers of the retail establishments, visitors up to the tenants and the tenants themselves. And I think that, that the bike parking you want to uh, consider is, is going to uh, differ in location and type for each of those groups. Um, for the retail establishments, you want to think about um, racks uh, in front of, of, of the retail locations. For visitors, to, for the tenants, um, they would probably prefer bike parking close to the tenant's entrance. And for the tenants themselves, uh, I would suggest that outdoor bike parking uh, is uh, inadequate um, from, uh, largely from a security perspective. Um, and unless it is, uh, it, uh, covered is great uh, as a start, but unless it is secure and accessible only to tenants, uh, then I, I, I think uh, it, it uh, will not uh, adequately serve the purpose, and I'd suggest that you, you think whether it's possible to offer uh, an indoor bike room. Well, I've seen where they uh, hang bikes up to the side, uh, and if that would be acceptable, that's where the space would be for bikes. Uh, that, that's certainly one possible configuration, but I think for, for tenants who are, are going to be leaving their bikes uh, outside overnight, or perhaps for extended periods, <coughs> Uh, more security is is preferable. Uh, yes. Go ahead. Apologize. Mike just 
showed me a new plant here that I didn't see. Um, this, in that square room there on the ground floor, what is that thing in the middle? Oh, it's a stretcher. <laughs> this, this thing here? Yep. It's a stretcher. So that's an elevator. That's an elevator. There's an elevator there, yes. And then there's, it looks like three parking spaces on the, on the cover. <coughs> Does it, does it extend all the way to the storefront there, or is there a sort of a walkway there? Yeah, but I can't walk there. Yeah, there's a walkway that goes to the door. You say inside the building. You mean in here? Yeah. No, the, the, the walkway the is in here. Okay, yes. so we have a little bit of space there. Oh, you have a line going. So, so the parking does stop there. Yeah. All right. So we can have additional bike parking there, right? Yeah, but we wouldn't be able to close it because we're maxed out on our floor area ratio. We can't make the building any bigger than it is. I'm just worried that... So, yeah, point taken, but I mean, we, we could we could make an outdoor bike park. We can't put it inside. Okay. That. Well, what, what, let's say also, uh, I've noticed some of these uh, issues buildings, a lot of families just need the stroller or something down there somewhere. Easier. Some sort of allocation for them. They should put it with the bike somewhere, somewhere near there. Is there something? I, I mean, I think if we were going to start making more room for there, we'd need to be carving it out of the commercial space. That's one of the things it's, we should yeah. start concerned uh, mm -hmm. looking at. You know, and then um, your water room. Do you have a sprinkler room? Show them what's going to be in the basement. It'll be in the basement. Whatever, whatever the basement would be entirely mechanical. We haven't designed exactly how big it is yet because we don't know how big it needs to be. It won't be the size of the existing basement because we're not going to keep that. All right, so we'll be announcing it a panel on the wall somewhere, confirming the thing with the direction saying the water is down the basement. Yeah. Yeah. And um, maybe all of the questions are different, but generally, uh, if there's a water room, Assets still, they need to get, get it from the outside, not through the space. Is that true or not true? Uh, that's highly variable. But as long as they know where to go, that's a critical piece. I mean, it's true they often prefer going directly from the outside, but it, I mean, we cannot. Uh, we could bring that stair, the stair down to that. It would be from the stair. So, so a door can be placed on the outside. But you have to sweep the outside. Right there. Yeah. So I'm just fine. wondering if, you know, if that happens, I don't want the fire to come back to you and says, OK, I want direct access. Yeah. Right. Protected access and because then you're not, you're not going to mm -hmm. redo this thing here and uh, come back to us later. That works. Open it up. <coughs> Excuse me. I'll open it up to public comment. Uh, please raise your hand. I'll call on you. Stand up. State your name and address. Please keep your comments brief. Uh, I'd also uh, ask, I know there are a lot of people here for both of these hearings this evening, I would ask that any questions at this time relate only to 117 Broadway, the project we're currently discussing. Anything uh, about the next project will come at the appropriate time. you will get your chance to speak tonight. So, uh, public comment on 117 Broadway. No? Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Crystal Reddy, 56 Adam Street. My first question is um, whether this application has undergone review for zoning compliance by the Inspection and Services Department. When I inquired there, they didn't seem to have received it. Okay, to my knowledge is that they have not received it or reviewed it. But also, Inspection Laura, I'm sorry, I'm not aware of that. They, they yes, they have actually the request. So I don't know who you spoke to or when. Can you tell me who you met with? I met with my firm. And I dropped off another full set of plans last week. Have they given any written determination on zoning compliance? I don't know that. Not directly to my department. The board has not received one. We, I, I have not received any notification as such, but we can request it. Um, uh, the reason I ask is I'm curious about the uh, floor area ratio. And, and in particular how the floor area was calculated. Unfortunately, the plans don't seem to have a scale on them. And so when I look at them, um, you know, I had to just try to estimate the, uh, the, the area on each floor. 
I'm getting numbers that are considerably greater than what the applicant has put forth in the plans. And I'm wondering, are you subtracting off um, <coughs> out of the area from each floor? Well, I don't know how you're calculating it. So, uh, well, how are you calculating it? <laughs> by taking by the outside area at each floor. Uh, <coughs> we're, we're getting a total of 19,430 square feet, which is what we should have. And what's the ratio? Uh, well, you, you apparently have an application. Uh, I, I ask because I get I calculate it one side, <coughs> and I think the zoning bylaws for mixed use one is at one point five. We're looking at a, at a at the ratio of one point eight based on the uh, because the you're allowed to <coughs> bump it up on a couple of factors, including the numbers of portable yeah, housing. Sorry. You're allowed to increase the uh, floor area ratio based on the, uh, a couple of factors, including that it's for affordable housing. And we calculated that as going up to 1.8. Are you counting the commercial area as area that can be bumped up when you do that calculation? It, the zoning, as I understand, the zoning doesn't have a formula for exact for I guess you're asking if it's prorated in some kind of way, or? Well, I, as I read it, and I'm not sure this has ever been applied to before, I don't think you get to apply the bonus to the commercial space. You get to apply it to the affordable units, but not the commercial. Yeah. Uh, without going so, into the, without having the, the thing in front of me. I, because otherwise, remember like, the board got an application for the venture development. The developers, you know, they always max out the FA house. They don't say, oh, we're going to build um, up to the FAR for the uh, units that are not covered by the uh, zoning bylaw. And we'll use the extra 20% you get um, for the affordable units. That's simply applied that way. And my, my reading is that we only get to apply that, that bonus provision as an affordable unit. <coughs> I would simply ask um, one that you get that written determination, and also that the applicant submit um, a certified plot plan to do that for the building in the same way that someone would do that for the condominium. Um, so you actually be sure you have accurate numbers on the, on the plot information. Another question I had con concerns compliance with <coughs> the town's inclusionary zoning bylaw. I understand there will be 14 units. How many of those comply <coughs> The town's definition of affordable housing as written in the bylaw for the community of the zoning bylaw yeah. units. All of them. They're, they will all be rented to households at 60% of the low median income. They are all, most of them will be able to accessible. Um, are they fully compliant with all the provisions? I thought there were certain income provisions in our bylaw that yeah. housing corporation are on to I don't know what you're talking about. I've never heard that before. It has to do with the portability criteria that's applied to the people's income. For rental units, I'm reading uh, from the Inclusionary Zoning Bylaw 11.08. For rental units, a household whose total income does not exceed 70% of the median income of households in the Boston Metropolitan Area as defined by time. I think you're. I think you're out of date, it's, we changed it to 60% some years ago. No, that's how the rent is calculated. Well, we yeah. are we are all 60 below anyway. And that's how we, the, we, we don't rent to people who make more than 60% of the income at the time that they first lease. Over time, they are allowed to earn more income. But there's, there's more to what the requirements are, the decisions are applied on. To, to the first point made, I'm happy to provide any follow-up and have a conversation with my firm, the Director of Instructional Services, for any preliminary determination or understanding of compliance with zoning. Thank you. We'll provide that to the board. On the other matter, we can also check and confirm compliance with Section 11.08, which I believe we've already done in our report, but we'll confirm that again. On the mixed-use spaces, you know, one of the 
goals that these users to improve the street cleaning activity along the uh, commercial areas. Um, can you tell me how many hours per week the, the commercial spaces will be open to the public? Well, I can tell you right now what I know the food pantry and Food Link operate. Food Link is in the building seven days a week. Um, I would say a minimum of five hours a day. The food pantry is in the same location currently, um, and they are open far less. They're open two days a week for about three hours a day. Regardless, any tenant would be subject to special permit review by this board. Anyone I, I would ask that you put conditions in that would, whoever occupies any of that commercial space, you know, be open, say, at least 40 hours a week in public. Um, because otherwise, you, know, you sort of defeat the purpose of having mixed use if you're going to have spaces that aren't open most of the time. And, and the other part of this, um, I would ask that. Often you see in these mixed-use buildings, I'm not specifically referring to ones that have affordable housing in them, the commercial spaces stay vacant for months and months, if not years. And I would ask that you put some provision in the permit um, that limits how long they can be kept vacant, say, without calling the uh, owner uh, the permit holder back before the board. You know, we saw that happen at the uh, Brigham Center, the little kiosk, and it was like two or three years before that ever got rented. Again, if you're going to be using this as your first uh, mixed-use development, okay. I'm very careful about being sure that you're We don't have an objection to this. We feel certain that we'll rent it. Um, yeah. The 40 and hours a week, just, I'm not sure we can impose that. That's how they can store yeah. from registration yeah. and tell me. Yeah. And so again, right. any time would have to come from this right. board again to be real. Um, any further public comment? I think what I'd like to do in the interest of time with your agreement is to have you come back to our next meeting, uh, answer some of the questions that we've asked. Uh, I'd ask Jenny to, to speak with inspection services and have Mr. Burr and Pine on whether this is appropriate. Uh, we talked about seeing a landscape plan. I'd like some updated plans for some of the revisions that we asked to see, uh, and then samples of building materials and certain things. TDM. Updated transportation demand management plan and, and, and bike storage. Yeah, and, and updated to the zip car feasibility. Yeah, I'll make that more complicated. screening. Um, now, can I ask that we, we have a deadline to get an application into the state uh, early December, mid December. So, uh, can I ask that we. Our next scheduled meeting is November 21st. That would work for us. Uh, so I think, uh, I'll, uh, I'll make a mo uh, I'll motion, make a motion to continue uh, until November uh, 21st. Uh, yeah, I will close the public comment uh, at this time. We will accept written comment until then. Uh, no further public comment will be allowed tonight or at the next hearing. Uh, so we'll be to review things in both. Okay, so I've got to it. I second it. All in favor. Aye. 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 Thank you. So moving on, we have a public hearing, uh, EDR Special Permit Document 3519, 19R Park Avenue, also with the Housing Corporation of Arlington. Open 
the duration of this time. Thank you. Begin. Members of the board, Mary Wynn Stanley O'Connor, uh, representing the Housing Corporation of Arlington. With me, the Executive Director, Pamela Hallett, and Data Square Architects are here as well on this uh, project. Uh, this is another, uh, this is a exclusively residential affordable project. This is an R7 zoning district, and as the board is aware, an R7 zoning district is primarily an apartment type of zoning district. Um, for those of you who've lived in town for a very long time, you may remember that this is a little junkyard uh, behind the Citgo gas station. And what uh, the Housing Corporation has completed a phase one and a phase two environmental uh, testing at the site and has, as we detailed in the impact statement, found um, that there are um, there's arsenic, lead, uh, PCPs, and uh, VOCs on the site. Uh, they will be help of licensed site professionals cleaning the site uh, in accordance with EPP regulations. What the Housing Corporation is, uh, is uh, proposing here is two buildings. One would have 28 units and would be served four stories. One story actually less than permitted in this uh, zoning district, uh, which would be over along by the bike path at the lower grade of the property so that it would indeed look lower than the four stories uh, itself. And the other, uh, towards the Lowell Street end, uh, would be six units. It would be a walk-up, three-story walk-up. Uh, the Housing Corporation <coughs> had a community meeting, and they did receive some uh, some suggestions from the residents, one of which was they wanted a redesign of, this, of the six-unit building, for the one along Lowell Street. Uh, they uh, wanted some, to see some reworking of that design. Uh, some of the other questions that were raised were uh, with respect to traffic. We had a traffic study done. We have provided that to you by BSC, uh, which indicates that there will be virtually no uh, substantial impact on this intersection. Now, I should point out that this site, um, something is going to go there. It's not going to be vacant land. And as the board knows, residential is the least intrusive traffic-wise. If you put retail there, there would be far more trips generated. Um, the traffic study was based on 38 units. There are only going to be 34 units, so it would be less of an impact. It also included, uh, as you know, the, the uh, Housing Corporation received a permit from the Zoning Board for a 40B at 20 Westminster. That property will have no parking. And one of the conditions in connection with that permit was that the leases would specifically say that the tenants could not have cars. In fact, if the tenants did have a car, um, their lease would be terminated. So the um, traffic consultant included nine spaces for 20 Westminster, but there are no spaces. So there would be less of a traffic impact, I would suggest to you. So we have provided you with that information. Another of the concerns was that, what impact would this have on the Pierce School? Um, Pam tells me there are four empty classrooms at the Pierce School um, as well, even though I don't think that necessarily comes into the scope of the special permit. Um, we have seen the um, planning director's report, uh, and assistant planning director's report, we concur with the um, general recommendations of the spe special conditions proposed, and um, if you'd like, we can turn it. We have, we've heard what the board has said about the traffic management plan, we will deal with that. We do not have a landscape plan, we need to get you a landscape plan and a lighting plan for this site. Um, and the architects have not had the time to rework um, the front building uh, uh, at the suggestion of some of the neighbors. Um, I can let the architects, and I don't think I need to repeat what I told you about households on the waiting list for affordable housing. All of these units would be rented to people earning 60% or below of the median income. So they would all have that restriction. So if you'd like the architects to speak. Well, let me say one other thing. Sure. Um, to help with the cost of the cleanup, which we envision being about $550,000, we are uh, planning to submit a proposal for funding to the EPA in December. Uh, in order to do that, we have to make a put a public uh, notice out and list our plan uh, to go to the EPA, and we'll be doing that in the next couple of weeks. We will do the notice. We will let you know when that's listed. People can go ahead and look at it and make comments on our website. So I just wanted to make sure that was clear and in there. The only other thing I would say is, as you can tell from the plans, this site is a little less than an acre. 
Um, the board, um, maybe 15 years ago, 13 years ago, approved a special permit for this site for 23 condominiums, 26, with 26 condominiums with 40, uh, 48 parking spaces, I believe. Um, so this is, uh, I would suggest, less intensive parking uh, type use. Okay, All right. that over there. So I'll start with kind of the bigger picture issues. I think that uh, what is really exciting about this site is bike path, of course. And a lot of the inspiration of what to do this, to the site, how to lay out the site plan, as well as the language of the building and the scale of the building has a lot to do with where it is. And the idea is really to make a very strong connection to the bike path, actually the front of the building, so to speak, is the bike path. And uh, what we're providing as a, a public uh, amenity that is related to that is creating a fully accessible path from the street all the way through the site and out to the bike path. And we're looking at a bridging across a stream at that point and making another connection to the bike path. In addition to that, we're talking about um, a, a very energy efficient building that kind of relates to the, uh, the notion of physical activity and uh, sustainability. We're designing the building to net zero or near net zero standards. We have terrific southern exposure on the site. And some of the materials, which I don't have samples for, but some of the materials that we're talking about using on the building, Paul can talk about that somewhat, are actually some south-facing solar collectors on that elevation as well as panels on the roof. Um, the goal of of the placement of the building and it's, it was made easy by wanting to really relate to the bike path as the, as the active face of the building was pushing the building as far away from the neighbors as we could towards the bike path, uh, which we did. We have single loaded parking and the building is also for the uh, single loaded because we are working with this net zero idea and really taking advantage of the, of the uh, strong southern exposure. So I think what we're really trying to do is make a building that is, and this kind of says it all to us, that we see a lot of people coming and going from this building on the bike path, and that's, that's really uh, what we're trying to foster in this uh, building. We have provided some uh, open space that would primarily be used by the residents right on the bike path, um, and as I said, uh, limited parking to the rear. Uh, but Paul will run you through uh, more detailed plans. So on our site plan, as Cook was talking about, our access off of Lowell Street, we keep, keep that to the maximum distance we can from the corner of, of Downing Square. So we bring that back further. Uh, really, there's not a, really any good way to access from Park Avenue. So really the only vehicular available vehicular entrance to the site is there at Lowell. So we would come in here, we'd bring that, we'd go through this little neck of our property line. It's sort of like we have one space here and then it narrows. We just get past that to get into our parking lot at the back here. We So we have uh, accessible parking at three locations along here and then a larger row of parking, so single lit as close set across uh, opposite the event. We do have a planning strip. The fences of these buildings are all solid fences there where we would also be planted along that edge as well in order to screen the headlights or whatever coming from uh, towards the, the neighbor's houses. Uh, we'd have access that would take us to this ramp. It's a rather large lot, large ramp because the, the elevation difference is eight to 10 feet depending on where you start from to, uh, to get down to the level of the bike path. Uh, we are going to be starting negotiations with the, uh, with the T who has the right, who, governance whether or not what we can actually we found out that the town manager has the right to give us that permission so we'll be talking to the town manager Splendid. Okay. yes thank you um, so anyway we uh, so coming past our building our building at this side the uh, it's three stories we have uh, a total of six units six two-bedroom units in the smaller building here at the corner uh, 
we come around to the back here and then we have our larger four story building as Cliff said we're single loading this corridor along here so most of the this white area along here is either uh, common uh, mechanical spaces or corridor trying to keep all of the unit units oriented as much as we can to that side with the exception of this one which is a full 20 feet set back from the uh, from the neighbor's properties on that side um, so leaping through plans and I don't know if we how we're going to go about going through all of these but it's kind of extensive. so starting from the ground floor of the smaller building we, we come in through a door down here we have a single stair coming up and serving these units they stack the same layout two bedrooms going all the way up the larger building the main entrance would be further along to the towards the end of the parking lot. That would get us to our elevator mechanical room. And again, this corridor going through there. And then most of these units just stack similarly going all the way up. Part of what we're also trying to do is to, is to make the stairways more uh, amenable to people using stairs and encouraging that active lifestyle, as, uh, as, as Cliff mentioned, of, being, of walking upstairs encouraging that use instead of just using the elevator all the time. Um, I'm going to go on to the elevator here. So we're Yeah, so we're locating some, we have some various locations for bike storage. We have some, again, it's outside bikes, bike parking, but we could cover it um, along here, along here, and on the bike, on the bike side. But again, uh, it should be secure, not just covered for right. residents, and, as well as for visitors uh, need parking. I, mean, I don't know, have you ever seen the, um, the MBTA uh, <coughs> parking pages like they have at Alewife? Oh, yes. oh yeah. yes. Car yeah. key access. Now, those aren't particularly attractive. No, they aren't. <laughs> um, Chicago but, is a better example, actually. But, uh, uh, you know, if they had to be outside, uh, you know, there are examples to look yeah. at for how to do that in a secure way. Start looking at Dutch websites. Um, so the, uh, the elevation of the building from the uh, parking lot side would be, would be looking at a building like this. We've got uh, fewer windows along that, but the windows that you do have mostly because you're going on to a corridor at this point. Um, the elevation, as Cliff was saying, at the at the back of the building. So this is at the sort of at the top of our slopes. So there's an upper level here. It slopes down as you get closer to the uh, to the bike path. path. We're kind of floating in air right here. And I'm moving along to our other building. And so, you know, as Pam mentioned, we got a lot of really useful feedback actually about how this building can be reworked and and looked at again, and we're in the process of doing what we can to, to make that be a better, uh, you know, a really nice entrance to the Mount Cabone area. You know, one other thing I would point out is between that building and the St. Louis gas station, there's a needed right of way mm -hmm. that gives us the right to keep that clear. He, 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 the owner, Paul, must keep the right of way clear, which probably means fewer Autos, fewer lawnmowers, fewer snowblowers. snowblowers. Yes, that's <laughs> where, Yes, and we had to sign it and recorded it with the deed. So uh, he's fully aware that it needs to be kept open. Nice guy. It, it, he's a very nice guy, um, and it will also give emergency vehicles access to the deed at some point coming up. Our gap, but we will not use it.
So we're going to, this is basically going to be sitting on, uh, for, what, for all intents and purposes, piles, okay, with a structural slab. So essentially, this is this is going to ride above the level of the floodplain, um, and we're going to engineer uh, basically retention tanks for stores on-site water storage of whatever we get from. Uh, run off from the parking and from our uh, impervious surfaces on the roof. Uh, in talking to the town engineer, they preferred that to uh, pervious paving because of the soil issues that we have on the site. We don't want to have more water soaking into whatever is going, you know, eventually may, may be left on the site there. But it'll, it'll go into retention tanks and then, and then bleed through into the, uh, into the stream. So. Let me say that maybe you can tell me I'm right or wrong. So you're saying you have piles that are going to be sitting underneath that building, and the volume of the piles that you're offsetting will be taking care of those, in those chambers. So you're not affecting the floodplain. That, that's, that's exactly right. We're required to do that. So. And then you're going to put a podium or a plinth where the building sits on top of the floodplain elevation. So under, underneath the plinth, the water can run through. Yes. That's how you're addressing in the floodplain yeah. Yeah. and that's been approved by the DEP? We, we sat with the engineer. Um, yeah. We're still designing with the engineer the retention part of it, but he seemed to think it was a very acceptable idea. 
Sounds like there's going to be a whole, but another revision of this, based on. Did I hear that? That the design of it is going to be revisited. Corner, the front building. Corner building. building. Just at the front building. Yes, at the corner building. Okay, so we're going to see that. I mean, I would say I thought there was a good letter, and I don't know if Alexander and Christopher Roll are here. But they're probably going to talk. Yeah, I'm, I'm here, Christopher. Okay, we'll wait not yet. We'll wait <laughs> calling you first. I was just giving call. you a shout out because I thought Thanks. the letter. Had some interesting points about scale, and maybe you're addressing. I think you mentioned that, Canada. The scale could be more residential feeling by not making that big prow there at the corner. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, think about um, the, the letter said something about materiality of houses around it, so it feels like it fits a little bit. I understand it can be contemporary, and that's what's going on here. I'm not sure I understand what it means to relate to the bike path. You can relate to the materiality of buildings around. If maybe you're using, you've got a different. shingle, plank, mm -hmm. you've got a little bore. Uh, mm -hmm. There could be some texture. <coughs> you can try to soften it a little bit. Right, that's, a, that's what we're working on. It looks yeah. a little bit like factory feeling. Um, and someone made the comment, and I just brought that letter up, because it, it is in a residential neighborhood, which is a historic neighborhood. And mm -hmm. yes, it's a rough corner intersection that needs to be improved over time, but there's a lot of good housing stock around and behind it. So scale, materiality can be a little more inventive. Maybe that white panel that's the big scale division panel that you have on the other one. On the other, uh, you see a little bit of on that, on that rendering, but you see more of it on that one kind of thing. Are we one. talking about this? Yeah, give it, give it that a little texture. Maybe I see, okay. Not just panels of that front, but have some, yeah. uh, some other textures. So some some be, uh, finer scale textures. Horizontal okay. planking. No, I heard. This, you know, you see on all the houses around here, historical houses, planking, so forth. Give it a little more scale. It looks a little bit office-like. Less institution. Yes. That's, that's all I have about that, because I know that sounds like it's coming up again. Indeed. Mm -hmm. With uh, access through the site and from the site uh, to the Minuteman being so critical to this concept, uh, have you given any thought to snow removal? To the snow, snow, snow removal. Snow removal. To maintain that access year round. Yeah, we, uh, we have landscape and snow removal that take care of all of our sites around there as soon as there's half an inch of snow. So they'll be out there. Okay. And can you talk a, at all about uh, some of the energy efficiency features you envision the buildings having? Yeah, yeah. yeah. so the southern elevation, too. So we're, we're just engaging with our engineer at this point, but as I said, what we're, our starting point is trying to be net zero or near net zero. So we're starting with very thick walls, which is in this climate where the best money is spent. We are looking at PV panels for the roof. The rendered gray part on the southern elevation, we're looking at uh, collectors, the vertical uh, air collectors. There's a, actually one of the biggest panels of this type is in Cambridge on the JFK senior housing. If you notice that, you can see it from 93. And uh, so we're, to us, it's a very simple maintenance free way of taking advantage of the southern exposure. The reason we have a big differentiation of windows is looking at very large openings into the apartment living rooms. We would love to be able to get some passive collection in, in the floor. So we're looking at you know, floor toppings that would actually you know, uh, collect some heat. And, uh, but essentially, yeah, we'll have a, a Kind of what we do in all of our buildings, we have uh, energy recovery for uh, the corridor systems. This building, we actually have the option because our corridors are on the north side, 
we have the option of, of passively heating those northern corridors, and they do give us a buffer to the apartments on the inside. Um, what else have we thought of? Well, that's, that's about it. We're really trying to engineer this to make it as close to net zero as we can. We're, you know, we're, the time frame on this is such that but this project probably won't be permitted for almost two years. So if you're sensing a little bit of hesitancy when I think of how much this world changes from energy efficiency over two years, I don't want to represent every single thing because it really does change. The, the panels on that Cambridge building were just installed less than a year ago. Uh, we, it's our engineer. Uh, our engineer who did those panels is doing our building. So he's in an analysis mode of seeing how those panels worked over in Cambridge. Um, uh, but anyway, so that's why I don't have all the answers, especially your question about transformer location, for example. It's, uh, it's a little bit of a chicken and egg problem of, us getting our engineers to fully engineer buildings when we know they're not going to be built for two years because of the funding program. It's very difficult to do that. Uh, I think all your, your questions, up for the way they're going into my head is, is really useful conditions that affect the design of the building is in some ways only as good as we can go without fully engineering something, knowing that it's not even funded yet. Do you want me to talk about the time frame? Yes. <laughs> Essentially, we would put this application as a pre-application in the summer. If the state <coughs> accepts our proposal, they've seen it once before, if they accept it this time, um, now that we actually own the property, it looks more likely, uh, and we have some good funding commitments coming in, that um, then we will have to put in a massive, more detailed application in March. Uh, they will take until probably August or September to make a decision. If we are then funded, then we have to start the process of really pulling everything together. Um, and getting to a closing, getting to a permit, and having full permit design. So the very earliest we could even get into construction would be probably spring 2018, at the earliest. Uh, more likely another six months beyond that. And if they don't accept our pre-application in December, it would be an entire year. We'd have to wait to make another application. So it's, you know, we're early. One more thing. Uh, I, I did look at the traffic analysis, mm -hmm. and, and I want to talk a little bit about the Downing Square intersection. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I understand the analysis, and, uh, you know, assuming it's correct, and there'll be uh, little or no impact um, on, on traffic through the intersection uh, and uh, it's it's a relatively uh, low crash intersection I, I can attest from my own personal experience that it is a challenging intersection uh, whether you're driving biking or walking um, so I, I think with a project of this scale happening there it's uh, an opportune moment um, to work with the town on potential uh, improvements to that intersection to make it a, a safer experience for everyone, including all of the new residents who would be moving to these buildings. I've suggested that to the town engineer, and he said, oh my god, no, we just spent all that money. <laughs> well, so, but I also have, in, uh, the, our traffic study was done by the same um, organization that tell me that they've made several recommendations to the TAC that were never implemented. So now that they've finished the traffic <coughs> study, I want to go back, find their actual complete study, and see what they did recommend. Because actually, we do own you know, a big part of that intersection at this point. Uh, if we could work something out. I just want to warn you that when we were looking and asking for a uh, 40B permit for 20 Westminster, um, I took the traffic engineer with me to the site and said, okay, we own this one, and we might own that corner. Could we get a roundabout? He said, no way. We just can't do it. Peter Pan's in the way, and so is the church. So I don't know, but we're definitely looking into it. Laura, a question for you. Uh, on, does the town have a meeting coming up anytime soon to yep. have maybe consult on this traffic report, I know I myself, looking at the traffic report, seemed pretty um, 
straightforward. However, I think that would feel a lot better if, uh, if, we, if, if, if we could we make a recommendation to tack that they add it on and review it. Yeah. Yeah. That's one of the my suggestions as well. And I can see if I can. Kind of quick, you know, yeah, they'd be great to get well, there. they wouldn't but, do it at the meeting. They would say right. a few people would volunteer. Exactly, and, and come back to us with, uh, with yeah. maybe thoughts on it. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to remind you that we have closed preschool, so that traffic has disappeared. Mm -hmm. It used to be a minimum of 45 children a day getting dropped off and picked up. Um, so, you know, that that is no longer an issue there. And we're bringing back 23 parking spaces. And most of our larger uh, developments have parking lots that are not fully utilized. And I think the planning department had did a parking survey last year, which actually you presented to a uh, town meeting in April, saying that there really is excess parking in a number of the residential um, larger developments in town. So you should probably look at that as well. I don't really have any concerns beyond what's already been brought up. I think I'll reserve any comments on design other than to concur with Andy that I think it should be a little less institutional, uh, softer, and, and take into consideration some of the amount of lower personnel historic uh, district requirements as well. And get inspectional services. And get inspectional services opinion on both size, uh, scope, and uh, whether it fits with those requirements. Um, but this time, I'm, I'm going to open up public comment try to get through all of it tonight. Uh, I am going to close it at the end, but we will still accept written comment. Uh, so please be brief, uh, ask your questions, make sure they're relevant. You can raise your hand, I call on you, stand up, state your name and address. Uh, we'll go forward with it. So, public comment. In the back, sir. Yes, I'm uh, John London, town meeting member, Precinct 17. A uh, couple of questions and a couple of comments, if I could. Uh, I'd like to state that I am for housing, but I'm against this project. Uh, I lived down in Downing Square for 10 years, and it's been a constant nightmare down there. Uh, a quick question is, in regards to housing, I've noticed recently that Arlington Automotive is an empty building down there on Warren Street. Is that the <coughs> building that was mentioned on the other project? I mean, could that be used for housing? Well, that, the, the owner. Okay. Because it, it, it is empty as I've gone by. Second of all, uh, I'm wondering if instead of a housing unit, that any other kind of project could possibly go in there to give you an example. And I know this might sound kind of crazy, but maybe like up in Arlington Heights, we have right now two major banks. Yeah. Would it be possible to maybe consider putting a bank in there, which would give you less traffic, and maybe wherever the bank is now, whatever the bank may be, put any housing project in that particular space? That's I'll let the proponent answer that question, but that's an extremely speculative, risky move that's not really possible in the real world. But it's, also, state, but, yeah. it's also an R zone for residential and has been for as long as I know. And so to, we have to go through a whole zone change in order to do commercial. Okay, in answer to some of the other comments I've heard, uh, there's been mentioning of the school closing so that there be less traffic. The majority of the traffic that I saw from 95 to 2005 was passing through that intersection. It was not basically people that were going to work and do something in that intersection. They were all coming up Pole Street, Forest Street to get to Route 2. So a lot of that was commuting traffic. It wasn't necessarily people going into the Downing Square area. But you wanted to make that point. Also, too, which might not be relevant, when that bridge was christened by the late Governor Paul Salucci, I don't know if anybody noticed it, but there's only a sidewalk on one side of that bridge. There's no sidewalk on the other. When I inquired about that for pedestrian safety, I was told, hey, pal, you got to go to the station. 
we washed our hands with that job a long time ago. Within the past year, I've taken town manager Avon Chapel Lane down there. Because now that they've extended the sidewalks to come out into the intersection, this tire treads going over the sidewalks. And he asked me, how did this happen? And I said, Adam, it's the design of the intersection. People are just saying, I can't wait till they literally well, drive. Not to interrupt you, but in the interest of time, that's, that's why we've asked staff to apply transportation advisory committee to apply on this, what kind of solutions might be put in place to alleviate some of those concerns. Well, the last thing I will mention is living down there for 10 years, putting up with emptying of the dumpsters at 2.30, just to make the people who are going to move in there aware, emptying of dumpsters and businesses at 2.30 in the morning, street cleaning at 3.30 in the morning, and snow plowing and dumping five feet of snow at the corner of Bowl and Lowell Street and letting it sit there is not going to improve pedestrian traffic. I, can't blame I don't think any of those concerns are part of this. Well, it will be pedestrians. You're talking about pedestrians in that building without cabs. Well, actually, can I fix that? We actually, our sidewalks are completely clean right away, especially on our larger units. Uh, so that is not the issue that. Right, I can hide me here. I can hide me here. Can you hear me? Okay. Let me say it again. Our larger buildings, we always have that clean snow clean, snow plowed, snow shoveled um, very early in the morning by our um, professional snow removal companies. So they would start at 6.30 or 7 if there's an inch and a half, uh, an inch, half an inch or more of snow. Um, so if you've noticed on Westminster, those sidewalks have always been clear this whole last three winters that we've gone through. That, that other sidewalk that you're talking about, which is often not plowed, has nothing to do with us. It was the former seller that, you know, we now own that property. I'm talking about the intersection of Bowl and Lowell. Oh, that has nothing to do with us. That's, that's the other side. That's what I'm side. talking about. Well, that's, that's, the the, that's the other side of the intersection. All I'm trying to do is make you aware that that's where five feet of snow gets planted. Thank you for that. That's out of scope for this discussion. Chris Morrison, I live at uh, 118 Wall Street. Um, my property is actually bordered on three sides by uh, this project and the other on Westminster. Um, sorry? Two sides, actually. Two sides. There's, there's, two, there's well, property between yours and uh, our. Fair enough. Okay. Unbuilt. Um, so, uh, just some concerns uh, that I want to make comments on. I, I'd like to hear that it looks like there's going to be a landscaping plan that's a little more thought of coming forward. Just some concerns that I have there. Um, where the road access is on Lowell, uh, I think there's going to need to be some significant grading done there. I'm just curious how that's going to be done because I'm a little concerned that there might be a very large retaining wall that my property kind of looks right into. Um, additionally, I brought this up at the community meeting. Um, given the large scale of this project, the uh, refuse for the garbages, it'd be nice if it could not be a dumpster kind of on the parking lot like was internal. Uh, kind of hidden from view, not up against property lines. <coughs> yes, we have it. Okay. We have, yeah. For the larger building, it is internal. Completely. It is internal. Okay, yes. I, I know. For, that the, that for, for the smaller buildings, we are going to have um, carts, but uh, they will be surrounded by a fence, and it will be away from your property. Okay. Fair enough. Um, additionally, uh, given that traffic assessments have kind of been done here, you know, there's a question about schools. Um, I would kind of ask if it was possible, given the scale of this project and the just the amount of units in the area and how much is being put in this area, if an economic impact assessment can be done in terms of the local property values, the downtown area there for positive or negative. Um, but that's obviously a concern for me being right next to this, what's going to happen to my property value, uh, what's happening to the local downtown area. And finally, just a final comment. Um, you know, I'd ask, given that this is going to be about 43 units in this general area between this project and the other one, you know, is this how we want to bring low-income folks into our community? Um, I would be more in favor of having lower density, more spread out through the towns, so they're more integrated into the community. My concern here is that, given this density, um, are we really kind of 
bringing them into the community or are we just plopping them all in one small little area and do we run the risk that we're not going to actually be integrating them into our neighborhoods, into our communities as effectively? So I just think it's something worth considering. Okay, can I answer that a little bit? Um, first of all, over 300 households on our waiting list are already Arlington residents. So it's not like you're importing them and then putting them into the neighborhood. They could be living next door to you. They could be living across the street already. They're already here and they desperately need affordable housing. And Arlington residents are one of our um, uh, first priorities in terms of giving, leasing housing. Leasing. Sure, just for clarity though, yeah. uh, my concern is not necessarily bringing them in per se, my concern is more the concentration. I, I would rather have them more distributed folks so that they're more, they're more easily integrated into the communities. Well right then, now we have Capitol Square which is 32 units on two lots, so right next to to each other, with a parking lot in between the three buildings. Um, I know that most of the tenants who live there are pretty fully integrated. Uh, they work for different companies in the area. Um, they hop the buses every morning, and along with everyone else. The condo association next door has written me so many letters saying, thank you so much for doing this. Your tenants are great people. I see most of them walking out, taking public transportation. It's wonderful. Thank you so much for doing this. So um, I don't know what else to say. It is dispersed around now. Well, and the rest of our units are fully dispersed. I mean, we range all the way from Smith Street up in the Heights, all the way down to uh, the one on the further south is Dorothy over by the New Garden property. Right, so yeah, that, I mean, that's my understanding is that most of your projects are kind of smaller, more dispersed through, and this one is a much larger. Well, not most. 32 area. are at Capitol Square. Right. We have 18 <coughs> on Mass Ave, um, between 10 and 1100. Actually, we have uh, 18 plus another three, so that's another, what, 23. And then right down the street, we have another 10. So, you know, within a two block area, we've got. Yeah, and I think, I think you've made your point that, that, that this, is, this is a project intended to serve our well, that's and, right. and residents that are already here. That's right. And this is, you know, it's important to know that this is affordable housing. Affordable housing is, is as we, from the last project, 60% uh, of the median income. Yes. For the that's what our affordable housing for, for, is. Let's be clear, between the master plan and everything else that this town has done over the, the you know, since I've been at home for the past dozen years and since I've lived here for 20 years, is to try to expand and enrich our affordable housing stock. So I, I think that is, you know, something that certainly the, the, the town meeting and everything else has agreed in, in respect to the master plan, et cetera. So um, that is an important piece of this as far as I'm concerned. So uh, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Beyond the arc of the reservoir road, um, the school is not the problem with the traffic. The traffic, like uh, you said, comes from 95 and Lexington. And uh, I'm one two blocks down, and I wait 10 minutes to get out of my street to go to the corner. And this happens at 7 o'clock in the morning. I gotta get up at 6.30 to get out there and be able to go through. Um, the other thing I would ask you is if you could do a pit. Uh, public input during the um, cleanup of the property, would that be possible? It's possible, I'm not sure exactly what you're looking for. Input into the cleanup. Uh, not input, you but mean more like uh, we would be informed of the process, what's going on, oh, of course. on a timely basis. Certainly. And I would ask that all the neighbors in that area be informed. Absolutely. Uh, Gary Collegian, I live on 24 North Street. Hi. This is difficult because I, you know, friends. Good buddy, buddies. But I'm, I'm, I've grown up down the street from this my whole life. I don't know if I've heard of it. I've heard of it. It's beautiful. The door was there. Uh, I know it was behind it, but it's not a dump to me. Uh, I spent many years trying to get into Arlington, and that's not what I came here for. That is just, sorry, sorry guys, this is horrible. That is a monstrosity to put in the neighborhood that I came to move, to get a quaint little house, bring all the girls up, they get to walk through that intersection. That intersection has been a nightmare since I was five. Everybody's been here long enough knows. No way you can add 30 cars. To that intersection and tell me that there's no one in that. <coughs> number one. Number two, my, my headboard is on that bike path at night. 
and it's rank. And it's going to get so much worse. Put entrance to it, and people, kids going back and forth to that train station or that bus station. This is just, like you said, maybe a different use. Put in a couple of nice houses, a couple of nice houses, low income houses, four or five. 20, 15 years ago, we were approved at 26, and everybody was like, how can they put 26 houses there? 43? I mean, it just seems, it, it seems to blow my mind that it's even logically thought about. You know, I can go into the, the thickness of the walls and all that, but that's too, uh, my kids can't even get to school because of that intersection. It's, it's a death trap, and, it, and the town has been trying, 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 it's how much money, you can't add 30 cars, I think they didn't even know what that is. It's absurd. Uh, the, the school, I used to go to the school meeting at Pierce. The school has been overwhelmed, overwhelmed, overwhelmed all these years. Too many kids. Talk to anybody here who's got kids in Pierce. They're, those, those, uh, that thing is packed to the hill. And then there's meetings every couple of years. We're going to close the school. What are we going to do? Everybody gets up in arms, and now we're going to add. 43 houses, two kids a piece, 86 kids. I, it just the numbers just don't seem to add up to me. I, mean, I don't I don't see how anything can happen. That's a city block. That's a city block. This isn't a city. This is just a nice town block. This is you know, nice houses. Not these. I mean, I see it's, it's pretty. I mean, I respect the architecture, but that's not Arlington at all. You know, I just don't see how it's even remotely thought of. You know, other use, couple nice houses, fine, but it just it just blows my mind. I got a list here. I don't want to waste a great time, but I just I can't believe it. 26 units was a, was a mind blower back then. We're adding 20 more. It seems to be okay. Thank you. Can I, can I just add? It's it's 34, and so that people know, 15 of them are one bedrooms. They're not across the street. 14 are two bedrooms, and five are threes. Just sit in my room and listen to the bike path at night. You're going to add all those people. No cars. Just that. I'm all going to park them on, on, on I one street over near him. When they can't park and their friends come over because there's no parking, they all come down my street and the next street over and it just gets jacked up. It's already starting to get that way. I can't imagine with half a month parking you actually need. And that's not a, it's not a brook, by the way. It's a, it's a, it's a protected weapon. That needs to be taken into consideration. Thank you. Chris. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chris Lurendi, 56 Adams Street. Can I assume the zoning review was the same as for the last um, project that was before you just some informal discussions with the building inspector? We had meetings with him and we submitted plans to him last week. In your packet, usually you get a um, set of dimensional requirements and how the project meets them. I was wondering if you had it for this particular application. And my question is, what is the required frontage and what is, what is the provided frontage on that I don't I can answer that because I, I look at my name, Mr. Chairman. And on R7, the required frontage is 100 feet. The frontage there is 96.9, but this project is grandfathered uh, because uh, uh, bylaw came in afterward, and I would suggest to you that the part that is grandfathered under 48 section 6. I think that's something you, you, you should look at. Um, the next question is what is the required parking and what is the provided parking? The memo that I provided to you. Total parking required is 48 with reductions. Uh, we can bring that down to 12. Where do you get the 12? 12. 75% reduction. Does that apply in the R7 zone? Yes. It does not. Because I read the bylaw, it says that the parking required in R6, it does not say R7. It says it's required in R6. Right. It says it's required in R6. 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 It's required in R
Now, it says specifically by a special permit to allow a reduction of parking spaces in the R5, R6, business and industrial zones. Well, we've asked the inspe inspectional services to review and go through this, but it is multi-family zones. It should be allowed. It, it's not mentioned. I'm reading. I just downloaded your zoning bylaw from your website, and it does not include the R7 zone. Similar I want to go to on record. Comment, we will ask the I want to go on record. The town meeting did not pass that. Did not pass that language. We will ask the building it's inspector to review that, Mr. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the other question is, does any of this structure exceed 40 feet in height? Or either of the structures, I should say. The question is, does any of the uh, building, either of the buildings exceed 40 feet in height? No. And if so, has anyone feet. done the height buffer analysis for the residential areas that are close to them? To see if the height buffer <coughs> zone applies. Well, they're, they're four stories, <coughs> maximum of five stories. They go to 40 feet. Again, inspectional services will review that. Now, I'm right. astounded that you don't have that information provided to you. But just getting, getting back to the point about the frontage, I, I would suggest that the attorney representing um, the applicant is well familiar with the Brigham site, which certainly <coughs> predates the zoning bylaw as well. And at that time, they were required to go before the DBA for the variance. I think that's quite likely in this case. We showed that Brigham That was, yeah. Yes. We're good. We'll leave it. We're yeah. good. Well, it's a totally different question. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm Vera Wayne. I'm on Dole Street Place. Um, I, I have a couple of concerns about this project. Um, and I guess I'll start with the environmental concerns. Um, I was looking up on the Mass DEP website, um, the public records for this site, and the most recent um, the most recent documents that they had in their database were from 2012. And so I was wondering um, what the status is of the filings of the information that you found out about the environmental steps of the property with DEP and if there's an RTN. RTN um, seems to be the number that they file things by. Um, I don't have that information offhand. The 2012 has been our information that we gave you. Okay, um, and I guess um, you mentioned working with um, L with LSPs to clean up the site, um, and I was wondering um, what the status is of uh, have you have you hired the LSPs or um, they've been under contract to us for, for almost forty years now. Okay, um, and so who are the LSPs that you're working with? DEI. Okay, which is our major. I have another consultant. Um, okay, thank you. Um, I, um, so beyond that, I did also have um, some concerns about the height of the four story building, especially as um, one of the gentlemen over here mentioned um, wanting a shadow plan um, to see what the impact would be on the houses on Wall Street Place. Um, because it looks from the plans like it's um, going to, in the words of one of my neighbors, going to basically block all of the sky um, for several of the houses um, that above the project. Um, so I, it would be great to see those shadow plans. Um, or, and. Um, the, the other thing was um, that I did want to also express concerns about the visitor parking. Um, but I understand that the tenants themselves um, are discouraged from having vehicles and the, um, that there are mechanisms to enforce that in the lease. Um, but I, as a um, gentleman over here was saying, there are concerns about visitors parking um, all, um, all over the side streets um, if they can't park in the parking lot. Um, and so I just wanted to um, mention that concern. Thank you. Yes, Kevin Clayton, Street. Um, 
the wet zone, near the wet zone. Um, does conservation here know that it's in the wet zone? Did you file? We've no? met, we, we haven't yet filed with them, but we've met with the staff. You did? Yes. Okay, and they came up with the plan of the pile underneath and how you build. And how far back you should leave it to be. We talked about that. Uh, my name is uh, Neil Mongo. I live at uh, 12 Braddock Place. I'm a board member of the Housing Corp of Arlington. Um, I just want to um, state a few things about the tremendous need for affordable housing in Arlington, and, and I think it's uh, <coughs> been indicated by Mr. Kayer and others that it's, it's, a, it's an important concern to, to uh, work with in Arlington. Um, I also want to uh, so I, I speak in favor, obviously, of this project. I also think that it's important to understand what, what a great service in many ways that the Housing Corporation will be providing to deal with this extremely dirty, chemically dirty site and this piece of land that has been sitting there for a long time unused. And I think that uh, it's, uh, it's a great testament to the Housing Corp of Arlington to take on this project. The risks of involved in redeveloping a piece of property like this are, are tremendous. And, um, uh, it's, it's going to be a, a really fantastic amenity, I think, for the town on this, right on the bike path there. Um, one other thing just about the development of affordable housing and the concentration of the size of developments, I think it's important to remember that our development on, on Mass Ave, the um, Capitol Square development, right next door to it, there is being constructed new market rate, high-end housing that uh, is happy to have us as neighbors, and I think when affordable housing is developed and designed well, and <coughs> notwithstanding the comments about the, some of the design issues that I think we've heard very clearly, um, it can be a very good neighbor. It can, it can be a great amenity for the neighborhood. So I just want to speak in favor of the project. Thank you. Sir. Uh, Ethan DeFries, 22 North Street. I realize that I have no control over the way it looks, uh, but it does look like a Soviet block. And, uh, it's way too high, uh, but that's fine. I, that's just my opinion, and I can't really say much more with that. But I am concerned being on North Street right there with the parking. Now, I know we've been reassured over and over again, but if you have 43 units, they're going to be 100 and some odd people living all of a sudden on a corner of the street. And yes, you have a, a single room apartment, but you might have a wife and a kid. So there's three people right there. Um, I've seen people have six people in a two-bedroom apartment. And I just don't understand how 43 or 63 cars are going to be in there. Because even if you just have slots for the people, as they've said, you have visitors. So they drive down my street, park, and scoot <coughs> along the bike path to get to their friend's house. <coughs> because it's right there. They're putting a nice entrance onto the bike path. We have entrances onto the bike path. It'll just be a, a thing they do. I, I guarantee it. They're just going to park in front of our houses, and it's already clogged along those streets. Now, in the winter, Lowell Street becomes a madhouse because you have two, you're parking on both sides, and you have two-way traffic. And I was going to come to a town meeting sometime and suggest that, that the side that the compound is being built on uh, be eliminated so that it was only parking on one side of the street because in the winter with the buildup of s streets and everything it becomes like uh, snow it becomes like Cambridge uh, and my kids walk to school on those sidewalks and it's, just, it's it is a complete nightmare I can't see bringing that many units into that area it's just crazy and so but I have no power over that I'm just expressing an opinion and I believe everyone in this room has the same opinion, as well as the other 500 people in that neighborhood that didn't show up tonight. Thank you. And please change the look of it. <laughs> I, think they, I think they've heard that. <coughs> I just wanted to say, if, you, if this gives you any comfort, at Capitol Square, we have 32 units, 32 parking spaces at any time, whether it's 2 o'clock in the morning, 2 o'clock in the morning, 2 o'clock in the afternoon, Saturday, Sunday, Monday through Friday. We have 10 to 12 empty parking spaces. So, you know, even if they are allowed parking from our perspective, they just don't utilize it. They don't need it. 
secondly, we give out stickers uh, for our parking spaces, and we will implement towing if we need to. We do in other uh, developments if we end up having problems. We have done that in the past. We will do it in the future if we have to. And you have every right if people park in front of your house and you don't think they belong there to call the police and to get them. Yes, sir. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> good evening and I think good night at this point. Uh, Chris Rowley, <laughs> Westminster Ave. And, and thank you. Um, I'll certainly tell my wife here proud of her letter, <laughs> uh, our letter. So um, I, I, I don't want to touch on all the points. Uh, I think all have spoken well about them. And uh, we've been to several community meetings. And um, the, the group here has listened to the comments about the aesthetics. And um, to, to your point on the height, uh, the, the, the bike trail height, that back building, the larger of the two buildings. Um, while maybe a certain number of stories at four, I believe, plus potential so solar on the roof, um, we do have a, a large grade from the bike trail up to that building. So it's essentially, maybe not exactly on feet, another story. And so from the bike path, you just should consider that as a, a number. Um, and, and there's several examples of my peers here, my neighbors have commented on the, the total number. Um, and we shouldn't lose sight of the combined Westminster Ave project with this new project. It is a large impact as a combination of the two units uh, together. So while one was permitted uh, differently at a different time, and this is obviously its own separate project, they, they, they're there. They, they impact each other, so we, we can't lose sight of that. Um, lastly, I just have a question for the, for the group. Um, you've, you've asked for a number of documents and uh, plans and surveys to come out. I'm wondering when the community is going to be able to see those. I do understand the transportation plan has been um, conducted. Uh, it has not been made public to my knowledge. Um, and so we all look forward yeah, to it. Any, any piece of the application is public, you can get it at the department of planning, community development. Everything is always public. Okay, so we need, we, need, we need to come and seek that out. There's not going to be, um, at like your next meeting, would there be an opportunity to see those plans? Or? There would be an opportunity at the next meeting. If yeah. you'd like to see it before then, we'll okay. check with planning and community development. They'll let you know. Very well. Thanks so much. Other comments? Yes, sir. Hi, uh, Peter also a Wall Street place. Um, we've, I mean, basically we're hashing over the same thing um, all night long. And what I'm hearing, what you're hearing, but especially I think what we're all feeling is that this is um, a very large project that, you know, to me feels like it's just being thrust on the neighborhood. And I was trying to, I was trying to imagine in my head exactly what this would look like. Um, the pictures are great. I love it. I actually prefer this style of architecture, I think, you know, I think it's wonderful. Um, I'd like to live there. I don't live there. I live right behind it, or right next to it, or someplace around it. But what I don't see are the neighboring houses that are conspicuously left out of all of these drawings. And I think what you would see if they were included is um, this four-story apartment building towering over the rest of the neighborhood. Um, there was a mention about uh, sky being blocked out. I tried to figure, uh, how high 40 feet is. Um, and because I'm human, I have no idea how tall 40 feet is. I can count 40 feet on the ground, but that means nothing to me when it goes up in the air. So I started thinking, well, what else is 40 feet tall? Uh, and after, you know, I'm a sports fan, this is actually three feet taller than the Green Monster at Fenway. So um, I'm pretty sure everybody knows how big that is. So if you're willing to put the green, four-sided Green Monster in the neighborhood, then that's fine, but you need to say that's what we're doing. Um, floodplains and other setback rules, you know, don't apply when you're talking about a giant wall 20 feet off your property line. Um, and of course, all the other concerns, you know, just second them. Uh, garbage, thank you for putting it inside or at least containing it in some way. Um, I'm still concerned about the vehicles uh, being able to gain entrance. Um, I'm sure the numbers probably say it can't happen, um, but I'd like you know, some more, maybe actual thought about how one of these trucks will get in there, um, how it's going to back out of there. There is some, I guess, emergency access that's being reserved from the neighbor. That's great. Um, snow removal, of course. Um, living along the side where um, the, uh, I'm sure, um, very conscientious landscapers will be dumping the snow. That's going to pile up very quickly, and with 20 feet. Uh, maybe 20 feet separating the property lines and the parking lot we're talking about. 
um, many cubic feet of snow that were piling up there, even with a small storm. Um, of course, there's a the noise on the bike path. Um, just the, you know, the several dozen kids or whatever that are already tracing through the neighborhood um, at all hours of the night. Um, adding more, uh, more noise and more traffic um, is going to impact the neighborhood. Um, and traffic, of course, traffic sucks, right? I mean, but it's also Boston, so it's gonna suck everywhere. I just, um, I'm try I was also trying to imagine about what it's going to actually feel like. So let's imagine just, you know, we've all been coming down Lowell Street trying to get through to wherever, up to two, down to Mass, up to Pierce. Um, imagine just one car trying to turn left into that driveway to get home. And you have two people who are dead set on not letting anybody go. What's that going to do to the other four people that are trying to get through that intersection? Um, we saw just, was it two weeks ago when they were doing the red light work, um, the stoplight work on Mass and Park Avenue. Um, that blocked up the entire neighborhood um, for most of the day. People were just not able to go anywhere. Um, and that was an actual red light. So what happens with just a couple cars who aren't able to turn left? Um, and I guess that's it. Yeah, and or if you have to take a 180 degree turn out of there to get, you know, to get out to uh, to wherever you're going. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? West Prescott, 44 Westminster. I've lived in the town about 2080. A long time. Uh, <laughs> on this particular street, our family but we bought the house about 15 years ago. So kind of new to this neighborhood as this neighborhood goes, and these I'm looking out to these people right. These are my these are my neighbors, right? We've got North Street, we've got Wall Street, Wall Street Place, we've got Westminster. We're trying to tell this board that if you put 34 units right there at that intersection, especially that intersection, it is going to jam everyone up. I I respect you know these developers for having the low income housing. I have no problem with it. And it's not like I'm saying not in my backyard. I'm saying not at that intersection. It, you, you've got to separate paperwork from reality. And the reality is a couple things here. Pierce Elementary is one of the very few schools in the town that doesn't have trailers in their backyard <coughs> housing kids and teaching them the trailers. Okay. Uh, you said that there are four empty classrooms at Pierce. I have a kid that goes to Pierce. Okay, I'm very involved with my kid. I'm very involved with the school. They don't have four empty classrooms. They use those classrooms. Maybe not as classrooms, but they use those classrooms for different things. For helping the children in different aspects. Either counseling or some sort of a care. But it, it's don't make it sound like there's storage rooms that are empty. We're looking at redoing our entire school system in order to have a place to put our middle school kids. Okay, Why am I even talking about Pierce? I'm talking about Pierce because it's right up at the top of that hill. This gentleman over here makes a lot of sense. If somebody's trying to come into, take the left into or the right into their parking spot, which, which you're going to provide, right? The parking in this structure. It's definitely going to jam up that, that intersection in the morning. Now you bought the you mind if I sit while I talk? Go ahead. You bought the nine unit, two three houses down from my house, and that's fine. You're laying down the law. There's no parking, but you can't tell them that they can't have people over for holidays to come over. It, it's going to flood our neighborhood with more cars. Now you're saying on top of the nine, you want to put 34 units across the street. You're very proud about owning half of that intersection. But I'm telling you, I don't own any of the intersection. I live four houses up from that intersection, and I sit in traffic 20 minutes to get to the end of the road. We're talking about 40, 45 yards. That, and it takes, me, it takes me 25 minutes to get down there. Now, I would just like you to, to actually acknowledge this, because what it seems like but from, what it seems, but please, let me talk, Mr. Finish up. Mr. Bennell, no. I will. I will in time because, you know, this means a lot to me. It does mean a lot. I understand. I was talking to her, not you. All right. Well, that's good because it seems like you're blowing off the neighborhood. 
like you don't care. I understand that this is a very, very good project that you're doing here. In this intersection right now, with the snow that the Northeast gets, there's next to no space for cars as it is. And you're planning on putting, my God, by my calculations, almost 40 cars into the neighborhood. 23. 23. 23 cars. There's 23 parking, parking spots. 23 parking spots. Oh, yes. And each of these people have the ability to have people over. Everyone in this room is, is a human, which therefore is a social animal, which has family and friends from over from time to time. I have to turn left half one to go down to Lexington and come back up. Yeah, I mean, <coughs> this is this is a, this is obviously an, an issue that everyone in this room cares about and wants to address. I'm going to ask that, that any further comments be addressed toward the board and not directly at the proponent. That's fine. But I'm also going to ask, you know, we we've, we've asked the proponents to go back and review this transportation plan that they put in and make arrangements for transportation demand management try to reduce yep. the need for cars. Now, as far as visitors, as far as parking, anybody who lives in a neighborhood has the right, to, the same right as anybody else to have visitors over and have guests park their cars according to town rules and what the parking laws are. I'm very familiar with the neighborhood. I live there myself. I know how difficult it is for parking to, to be done. We've also asked the Transportation <coughs> Advisory Committee to weigh in on this, yep. to provide uh, their opinion on how this will impact Downing Square and the outlying neighborhood. And we've also asked the proponent to come up with some other solutions with what they can do to alleviate some of these concerns. I'm wondering when that, that parking study was done, that traffic study was done, because it was done during the school year. The preschool parking is atrocious, and it comes all the way up Westminster. And I'm sure that maybe my neighbors might back There's no more preschool. preschool. No, her preschool, the preschool that she, the building that was in the, the preschool that was in the building that Right. The That's purchased is gone. Yes. The preschool right across the street from the church, church is alive and thriving. Yeah. And that <coughs> car has come all the way up past my house. Well, I'm going to tell you this. They're not here to defend themselves, and they're not part of this hearing. Absolutely. But, but their cars but, are. Their, their car, that is a I pertinent agree, and, point. And I, and I agree if with you're me. dumping 40 more cars into the neighborhood, all, we, all we can do is, is listen to you. We can't do anything about that. There are other groups in the town called police. You can call right. I have a question. Has this board actually gone to the site? Do you know what that <coughs> section is? Like? I know exactly. I drive through it every day. I know exactly what it looks like. I walk by it, I run by it. I'm very familiar with it. Do you take this into consideration with your decisions? I have to. I have to. The parking uh, counts was on October 19th and 20th. They can try to fix that intersection for four years. Probably fix it. Just dump the one. Committee wants to review it. It's the one that I can't figure it out. So, so let's just. Well, if, you, if you guys are going to have a conversation with each other, I have to take that Sorry. aside. With all due respect. So, real quick, you said you were going to close the public comments, and then after this, we have to go through writing. Doesn't that seem a little early with all the stuff missing? They don't even know the height of the building, really. Take that into consideration. Thank you. Other comments? Questions? I do appreciate everybody's input. I know that this is a difficult. Uh, <clears throat> project. It's a, it's a contentious project. I appreciate that everyone has been largely civil uh, this evening. Thank you for that. Thank you for your comments. Uh, as with the other hearing tonight, I think what I'm okay. obligated to do is continue this to the November 21st meeting, have you come back with some of these concerns, have TA, have TAC uh, address the issues, hopefully at, at their next meeting or soon thereafter, and we can come back. Uh, in the meantime, keep these lines of communication open with each other, please. I think it's been productive. I know uh, from the public meetings that have taken place, I think that's been the case. Um, Excuse me. Can I just one, one point? I didn't know that this was going to start at 7.30 until I saw the sign over there when I went over there. All public meetings are, are advertised well in advance. Or the one that I saw in the paper said 815. Well, this this hearing was scheduled on our agenda. I think that may be your concern. This meeting was scheduled for 830. That's kind of advertised. All all fair meetings begin at 730. Okay. Unless otherwise posted. With all these other businesses. And that, that's widely noticed on the website yes, around town. Uh, thank sorry. you. Thank you. I'll move to continue uh, the public hearing. Both. 
I, I just wanted to, to uh, make sure that we were clear in our request to the TAC uh, that we got <coughs> their advice on, on both the traffic at the intersection as well as parking in the neighborhood. Yeah, I, 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 it's my understanding that you wanted them to review the traffic setting. Yeah. I, mean, you're, you're, I think that's all we can do. That, what you need, you're not going to get it in two weeks. Yeah, that, yeah. that intersection is, we won't that intersection is. The, the notion is, is to look at the traffic study and make sure that the conclusions, yeah. et cetera, are. Review the traffic yeah, study, is, which they're, they're, I, I, they do that routinely. Yeah. So that's and if, if anyone has comments, questions, they want to take a look at the traffic study and see what, what's been provided, and community development can provide that to you. And I would suggest you go to the traffic advisory committee because they're the ones who know. They're the ones who know traffic. <laughs> you turn to them in time. <laughs> so, um, there is a motion on the table. I, before you motion, I just have one more question. A gentleman earlier mentioned the frontage. Why is it that they're giving away with not enough frontage on this project? No one's getting away with anything. If you look at the application. I just don't have a, the application. There's a, I, Happy to provide it to you if you want to stick around until after the meeting. I'll, I'll talk to you if you want yeah. to stick around and have a conversation with sure. Ms. Hallett and her attorney. That's fine too. We're just asking you to take it downstairs and outside. Or outside. Uh, but briefly, the application there's a, a maximum, sorry, minimum frontage of 100 feet. Their proposal is 96.9. And it may be grandfathered in under a prior existing statute. But the important part there is, is that's where the special services helps us out. In special services, they tell us whether it's good or not. And they'll be telling you about this. If you want to have a conversation with uh, Ms. Alex's attorney, please feel free to do that. I'm sure she can explain that to you more than adequately. So I move to continue the hearing until uh, November 21st. I'll oh, second. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, docket number 319. I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Uh, I know you're all here for this. Please take it out as quickly as you can. We have additional business to discuss.
um, main three windows, which are directly facing um, Massachusetts Avenue, and one side window, um, which is sort of at, a cur at an angle um, on the corner of the building, um, which is the corner closest to the um, Chinese um, Lucky Hot Pot, the Chinese Hot Pot restaurant, mm -hmm. um, and then also to replace the existing floor signage, which is um, currently sort of a metal structure um, illuminated from behind. Um, sort of, it's, a, it's just a sort of a fixed illuminated sign with a, um, a double-sided uh, vinyl printed banner. Um, we've taken a lot of considerations into effect when we were coming up with what we wanted for the signage. Um, we, we, we kind of looked around the neighborhood with the existing businesses um, so we tried to choose color and style that was relatively conservative, fitting in line with the other conservative signs of businesses in that neighbor on the East Arlington block. Um, and of course, the the, the sizing and, and the um, dimensions and all that. So the the banner would also be illuminated with the existing lighting from on top, which is on the building. I believe in the in the plans that we have, uh, there's a bracket with uh, lighting that's on the bracket, um, which is right above the sun. I don't know if there's yeah. anything else you want yeah. to add. Yeah. One blade sign or is it two? It's one sign, but double sign. No, the floor sign is on. Oh, there, there is two, you're right. There's two, there is two, there's two, there's two on Chandler Street and one on Mass But you only can do one on Mass Correct. And do you have any idea? Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, behind that sign, is there any repairs? You guys can just go ahead and blend in the brick, new brickwork and get it. So look at That's part of the thing to do. Yes. 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 We peeked behind the sign with an um, electrician. Yep because there's a conduit that actually runs along the corner of the building, connecting the two, because those current signs are both illuminated from the same power source. Um, so we sort of peek behind there. It doesn't look like there's really too much damage besides uh, a couple of uh, screw holes that are actually holding that in place. Um, any, anything that is there would be sort of fixed up again. Yeah, I, I have a question. The only question I had, so so whereas they had the, the floor assigned there, you're not going to have anything, you're just going to have the window decals instead. Correct. Okay. There'll be nothing involved with okay. that. No, no. That's all I have. Okay. Looks great. Yeah, I like it. Looks great to with that. So, uh, motion approved? Go right. for it. Go ahead. David, you have any comments? No, sorry. we love to. I could talk about bicycles, but. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we can get a bicycle park. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the EDR sign. I can do a bicycle. Docket 3161 and uh, 190 and 192SF. I'll, go ahead. Nope. I'll uh, second that. Somebody. All in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Thank you. Congrats. Uh, Congrats. Please. Good luck. Thank you for your Yeah, sorry. It's okay. Sorry. It's great. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, all right. We have uh, a few things left. I am going to only go to Jenny's director's report and table to the first. Uh, I don't get the way yeah, no, 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 so hopefully you've had an opportunity to review a memo that was prepared by Matt Strasberg, uh, senior planner, with regard to a Whole Foods uh, market bicycle repair facility that would be on the bike path. Um, this was actually already approved by the Board of Selectmen, um, as directed by the town manager, who, as you heard earlier, has authority over the bike path and things that occur along the bike path. Um, but they asked that the board review the um, sort of branding that the company would like to put on the sign. So that's really your focus um, here. And then, uh, 
Um, I don't, I, actually, that's really it. So, I mean, it's a whole description of what it will look like and um, where it will be located. So, I'm looking at attachment B. Yeah, I, I would prefer it. I don't feel better if I don't. Explanation is to keep a liability statement there if that's necessary. Um, okay. I'm, but looking at attachment A, is this as they've proposed to, to you? No, that's just an example. Yeah, okay. that's just the way I, it would look. Yeah, I think it, if you look at the last page in the bottom right corner, uh, that green wrap, I think, is all we're talking about with the tiny little right. logo. Yeah. Okay. And the and where you want the liability statement, the logo to go. So, do you prefer? There's one a typo in the liability statement. Yeah. Yeah. There's um, one typo. Yeah. 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 There's also argue. actually a. It's it doesn't affect the function. In this okay. I'm sorry. I can't hear when we're all talking. Did you want to make a comment? Well, David was. Really well, I mean, it's a great thing to install a you know bike repair station there. Uh, the the, uh, the aesthetic <coughs> that they're proposing to add is extremely minimal. Yeah. yeah. But nonetheless, the board has let me ask for your review. What do you want from us? I think it's just a um, resolution. You know, a, a, a vote. vote. Of, you know, which vote of approval to endorse. Vote to endorse the uh, the Whole Foods logo and liability language uh, as presented. Second. All in favor. All right. All right. Thank you. With that, I would like to take the rest. Yes. Everything is as is. And so I'll move to adjourn. Second. So you'll. Oh. You'll. I'm just. Set, uh, you're going to also move your minute approval minutes. Yeah. From we'll last time. Okay. Just making sure. Yeah. I'll have some comments from All the public hearings are now closed. All public comment closed for the evening. Okay. Move to adjourn. Second. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Thank you guys.